Okay, this is Michael Cuss. Um, hopefully we're all back from the breakout rooms. I, I'm not sure how well that went. Hopefully it went well. Uh, next up on the agenda is uh, uh, Julia Wickard. Uh, she's going to give us a welcome, logistics, and an introduction. So, Julia. Thank you, Michael, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's great that you've joined us. Um, my name is Julia Wickard, and I serve as the Assistant Commissioner in the Office of Program Support at IDEM and also the Agricultural Liaison with the agency. Um, and it's great that uh, we're all together today. Um, certainly want to thank Michael Cuss and um, his ability to be creative today and um, host us all virtually um, at the Michigan City Sanitary District. Um, looking forward to a great meeting today. Um, we have a whole host of speakers that's your um, Partners for Pollution Prevention um, Executive Committee has put together. And so hopefully you all have the agenda in front of you and uh, you can follow along. Uh, we've got a great morning program for you. Really excited that um, planning to hear from the, the mayor of Michigan City, Dwayne Perry, and um, just appreciate everyone stepping up and making today happen. So um, I do have a, a few updates for all of you from IDEM that I thought would be um, appropriate to share. And um, I guess before I do that, just a quick reminder to make sure and mute your, mute your phones or mute your uh, devices and also turn off your um, video. Um, there may be a time where we need you to turn those back on, but um, it would be really helpful um, if you could do that. So just a, a few updates with, for all of you. Um, IDEM and all of state government are planning to all return to the office next Tuesday, July 6th. And so all staff um, will be reporting um, to the office at that time. And um, it's certainly been an interesting uh, uh, 14, 16 months that we've all endured. And um, I know the, the transition is going to be um, difficult for some. And uh, we really uh, just ask you to keep them in your thoughts because as people have been working from home and that's all they really have known for the last 14 to 16 months, um, we're, we're certainly transitioning um, back to the office and it will be different. Um, IDEM is also working uh, very aggressively on um, the new wetlands law that was passed um, by the legislature. Um, it goes into effect tomorrow, July 1st. And we also are working on um, a CCR um, uh, permitting program, a new program for the agency that the legislature also authorized um, during the 2021 legislative session. Um, just a, a few other updates is our office has been really busy working um, and evaluating the governor's awards for environmental excellence applications that came in the door. Um, we actually are in the process of uh, vetting those through um, compliance and uh, we will have a, a group of, um, kind of independent neutral folks that will be evaluating those applications. Ultimately, then those recommendations um, go to the commissioner and the governor's office for approval. And then uh, what's really neat about those governor's awards, which are the, the highest environmental award that's offered in state government, is we present those at the P2 conference in September. So uh, for all of you that are planning to, and if you aren't, I'll make sure you get registered um, and, you know, once, uh, once you can. And, uh, and get to the Partners for Pollution Prevention Annual Conference in September. Um, we're evaluating 16 applications and there are seven awards that we will present um, at the, at the um, conference. Also really proud of the group that I work with in the Office of Program Support. Um, we actually did over 300 virtual Earth Day presentations um, predominantly in the month of April, which is, um, as all of you know, kind of Earth Week, Earth Month. Um, 
and we have heard from numerous teachers from all corners of the state that have been uh, that have been very grateful for us being able to continue some kind of educational environmental outreach to classrooms and we'll continue to do that. Um, we have some teachers that are looking for that virtual piece even next year and years after, um, but we also will um, most likely be returning to some classrooms as school corporations allow for us to come back in. Um, 2021 was the 51st anniversary of Earth Day. And so it was great to continue to be able to celebrate it. And uh, I can't say enough great things about um, our staff here at IDEM for really stepping up um, both here in the central office, but also our regional offices that really stepped up and made um, education environmental outreach happen um, during Earth Day and Earth Month. Um, tomorrow, July 1st, is the 35th anniversary of IDEM being created. And so um, trying to, to celebrate that in a, in a way that's um, celebratory, if you will. Um, we, have, um, we have employees who have been with the agency for 35 years, and we're planning an award ceremony in the State House Rotunda tomorrow at 1 o'clock. So if you're downtown and uh, you'd like to stop by our our awards program um, and celebration uh, will be in the State House at one o'clock um, to celebrate our, uh, our employees that have been with us for 35 years. Um, many of you know Mark Stoddard. Um, Mark just received a national award, but tomorrow he's going to be one of our IDEM employees that will be recognized for 35 years with the agency. So um, excited about that opportunity to, to showcase our staff. Um, we also just completed a very successful two-day um, electronics waste recycling event. We worked with the four regional offices, our Shadeland office, and our office here in the central part of the state and collected over 14,200 pounds of electronics. Um, this is our second time to do this, and we grew this year um, from the first time we did it. Uh, we're looking forward to continuing to um, put that kind of uh, effort towards future programs of electronics waste recycling and uh, ultimately uh, preventing those items from going to landfills. Um, the last thing I just wanted to share with you is our Recycling Market Development Board um, had a call out for proposals earlier this spring. Uh, we received uh, 20 grant proposals totaling over 4.69 million dollars. And so we are currently in the process of evaluating those applications and making sure they're complete. Um, and ultimately the, the board, the Recycling Market Development Board will be evaluating um, those applications at um, a future um, meeting later this summer and uh, looking at ways that we can um, continue to do recycling in Indiana, but also looking at infrastructure and market development opportunities um, in our state. As we've been talking with um, folks from across the country, uh, we know we're kind of in Indiana, we're kind of the epicenter of where some really neat things can happen as it relates to recycling. We're kind of at a unique crossroads and so really excited about that effort and really applaud um, our recycling staff for the work they've done. So um, with that, that's really the, the bulk of my message this morning. Um, I want to thank um, Jean Fix on our staff and Jennifer Collins on our staff for working um, collaboratively with Michael Cuss and the team um, to put on today's program. I want to thank the executive committee and you're gonna hear from Angela Taylor in just a little bit about some uh, regulatory updates as well. So Michael, I'll turn it back over to you or Ben and um, it's great to be with you today. So have a great day. Thank you very much, Julia. I appreciate the update and uh, good luck with getting everybody back into the offices. Uh, I know, uh, I'm sure it'll be smooth. Uh, I would like to say that uh, my interactions with the IDEM during uh, all of this time have been have been good. Uh, there have been no interruptions in service and people have been answering their cell phones and so forth. We've had emergencies and it's, it's been really good. So my hat's off to all the staff and 
Uh, if we pass along that, that would be good. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have something then, Ben, that you wanted to add? Yeah, I'll just give a, a brief uh, a brief presentation. Uh, you know, good morning to everyone, and thank you for attending our second virtual uh, partners virtual quarterly meeting. Uh, and a big thanks to Michael, you and your staff for hosting this meeting. Uh, you know, we do have a great lineup. Michael had spoke of of the individuals. Uh, you know, from the IDM update to the IUPUI presentations. Uh, we will have our partner updates here shortly. Uh, and not but la last but not least, you know, Michael and and, uh, and his presentation for the Michigan City Sanitary District. Uh, we hope this will be our last uh, virtual meeting uh, because our conference we're having is in person. If you haven't heard or you haven't seen the emails go out, uh, we are set to have the conference in person at the Marriott North, uh, just as scheduled. Uh, the Marriott uh, is to the point now where they have zero restrictions. Uh, there was just an, uh, uh, Wendy Krause was there yesterday. So, uh, you know, we can have the amount of people that we need and, uh, you know, uh, we can pick our menus now and, and get everything set up uh, to have a wonderful person-to-person uh, -person conference. We still have December's meeting open. Uh, if you know anybody that's interested in hosting a December meeting, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, we, we thought we had a couple people, but they weren't able to. Uh, I think they're still a, a little apprehensive of doing this, uh, you know, with just COVID around the corner. Uh, if we do not find uh, a host, uh, the executive committee, uh, along with uh, the, the group from the CTAP, you know, Jennifer Collins and Gene Fix and Julia and a few others, we, we may try to put on a... Uh, pollution prevention uh, quarterly meeting at a, central, at a location, you know, possibly in central Indiana, uh, if, if we can. Again, Michael, I want to thank you and, and your staff and look really look forward to seeing your presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Um, we are uh, very honored today to have uh, Mayor Dwayne Perry with us to uh, Mayor of Michigan City to provide uh, a little welcome and introduction uh, to everyone. I've got a few slides to go along with this presentation. I've been bouncing them back and forth here a little bit. I've had some trouble with getting them to advance, so that was the, the reason for that. Uh, I know Mayor Perry's uh, on the line, so uh, Mary, Mayor, if you would like to get started uh, with your welcome and your introduction, uh, Now's the time, sir. So looking okay. forward to your introduction. Great, thank you, Michael. Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Michigan City, Indiana, the state's crown jewel on the southern shores of beautiful Lake Michigan, America's largest freshwater lake. Michigan City is blessed with wonderful dunes and countless recreational opportunities. Michigan City is truly a sportsman's paradise in a community that is home to a natural environment that is second to none. Michigan City has long been a leader in environmental protection and pollution prevention. For instance, while many communities across Indiana are still designing and implementing their long-term combined sewer overflow control plans, Michigan City began its effort in 1962 and was arguably the first city in Michigan City to have a fully approved and implemented plan. The success of this plan is measured by the very infrequent discharges from our combined sewer storage basin. There has been only one discharge in the last eight years. Under my administration, pollution prevention remains a key to Michigan City's success. In fact, just this year, the sanitary district under Michael's direction purchased three new compressed natural gas dump trucks that will not only significantly reduce pollution, but will save considerable amounts of money as well. Additionally, energy saving projects have been implemented at nearly every city department. For instance, the, the sanitary district saved over 1 million kilowatt hours of electricity and over $89,000 in this last year. Later today, Mr. Cuss will provide specifics about many of the pollution prevention efforts 
that are planned, implemented, and ongoing. Again, I'm very pleased to have you join us for this virtual meeting. So please let me share a few photos of Michigan City with you. The first two pictures are of our iconic lighthouse. This lighthouse was built in 1904. The lighthouse has become the most popular symbol of Michigan City and is the only public operating lighthouse in Indiana. The elevated walkway known as a catwalk was used by lighthouse keepers for 29 years to access the light tower. The pier is a favorite spot for fishing and watching sunsets and is frequently painted and photographed by local artists. The next two pictures are the famous Franklin Street drawbridge. These photos were taken from Millennium Park. Millennium Park sits on the mouth of the Trail Creek Harbor. The next picture is our Michigan City Marina. The marina is operated by the Port Authority where Mr. Tim Frame is our Harbor Master. Here are some photos of the wonderful sand dunes that bless our area with Mount Baldy being Indiana's largest, most recognizable natural dune. Our Upper Town Arts District is a home to many great local shops and restaurants. The Uptown Arts District is home to the first Friday Art Walk Summer Series, the Taste of Michigan City, the Shelf Ice Brew Fest, and no visit to Michigan City would be complete without a guided tour of the Barker Mansion. And lastly, an aerial view of Michigan City and our most historic Washington Park Beach. Thank you for attending the Partners for Pollution Prevention June 2021 meeting. And you are all welcome anytime to visit historic Washington Park Beach, our Upper Arts District, our many renowned local shops and restaurants, or to enjoy a day of boating, fishing, and fun on the Great Lakes here in beautiful Michigan City, Indiana. We hope to see you soon. Thank you, Mayor. We really appreciate that introduction very much. And uh, quite a city, uh, really honored to have you as the mayor here. And, and we're all blessed to have such great natural resources here in Michigan City, Indiana. And uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, you're certainly welcome to participate in the rest of the, uh, the meeting if you would like to. Uh, thank you very much. You have anything else you'd like to add? No, just I, I'm very appreciative to have Michael Cuss as part of the team. Uh, Mike has, has definitely improved Michigan City, and he has great plans for our future. Thank you, Michael, for allowing me to be a part of this. Thank you, sir. You have a good rest of your day. You too. Thank you, everyone. Okay, uh, the next thing that uh, we have on the agenda then is the update from, uh, from Ben. Uh, ben, you had a presentation, so you wanna share your screen, so I'm gonna stop sharing mine, okay? Sure. Okay, I hope that everybody can see this. I'm gonna go back, so. I can actually turn my video on. And thank you very much for the introduction. Um, the Partners of Pollution Prevention are, are uh, very blessed to be able to keep going through all this time. You know, as, as Julia had said, you know, for the last 16, 18 months, you know, it's been pretty difficult. You know, we went several I uh, missed several quarterly meetings last year and we're able to start virtual meetings this year. And as I said earlier, we can go live uh, in September. Uh, again, Michael, thank you, you and your staff for hosting this meeting. Uh, I know you're gonna have a great presentation towards the end. Uh, I mean, you always do what you gave last year at, or two years ago at our conference, uh, you know, was wonderful. And well, actually last year at a virtual conference was wonderful. 
uh, and, and you have very high marks and scores and, and you deserve them. Uh, the executive committee uh, is made up of members of both industry, uh, consulting, government agencies and universities. Uh, I'm the executive director, you know, Ron is the assistant director and, and Krista is the interim treasurer. Uh, the list below that are, are the members of the organization. Uh, we do meet, meet once a month. Uh, we meet virtual and, and probably still will uh, for quite some time because to be honest with you, to meet virtual on a monthly basis for our meeting, this makes sense and then people driving. We have, currently have 105 members. This is the outline of the members. We do have a few more to update. So if you just became a new member and you don't see your spot, uh, you know, we, we still got a couple updates to make to this. If you're not a member yet and you would like to, uh, you can go to the link below and the link below will be on the website at the end of the conference. Uh, membership is free. Applicants must commit the, to the partner's pledge to be inducted in the program. Uh, there will, they do need to maintain environmental compliance. And each partner will be uh, required to complete uh, an annual partner's a recertification or an APR. Uh, I do know that there's, there is several outstanding APRs uh, for the last calendar year. Uh, I, I know it's been tough. It's been tough on everybody, you know, trying to, to, uh, to do these things, especially if you're working remote. Uh, you know, if, if you weren't able to do a project because of COVID and because of your remote uh, location, uh, you know, you can just tell us on your APR, you know, we, we, we completely understand, you know, from what we received last year and this year as well. Uh, by members request, you know, the communication and the networking among the members, we do have our LinkedIn account that's open to anyone. Uh, please take a look at it. There, there's some pretty good uh, comments that are put on this. Uh, we also have our partners only Microsoft Teams channel. Uh, there's a lot of good information or, or things you may want to, uh, that you forgot to ask or, or items that, uh, that you just wanted to look at again, and you can look at them on, on the Teams channel. And then we do have individual uh, mentorship and, and collaboration uh, groups. Uh, we have success stories that we want to talk about P2 projects at our annual conference. And, you know, we did have a comment uh, on... Uh, our survey from our quarterly meeting at AstraZeneca on one of the, the surveys, uh, an individual or somebody had put on there that they would love to do a, a P2 project, but you know, the, the company uh, doesn't have the resources. There's small things you can do that, that only take one or maybe two people that, that can make a huge difference. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of capital. It, it doesn't take a lot of expenses and you can make a difference with just one or two people. We do have uh, training opportunities, the 101 presentation series. Uh, the upcoming series include August uh, is the environmental restriction covenants. And the end of September, early October will be the stormwater requirements. And in November will be air permits, uh, how to calculate your potential emissions. I've actually uh, participated in a couple of these and Jennifer, I, I know you're not, uh, I know you're on here, but you, you've just done a wonderful job and your team has done a wonderful job of putting these together. Uh, I, I've been through a couple of them and, and I enjoy every one of them. And uh, you'll, I'll be on another one in November because I, I want to take that one as well. For marketing, if you want to join our LinkedIn account, you know, we do have uh, the link to this. Uh, you can invite business colleagues, you know, from other companies to attend. Uh, the meetings or join the groups. Uh, you can distribute partners materials uh, at the conference. Uh, it's a copy of our brochure. We actually bought uh, new brochures uh, just right before COVID hit. So uh, we have plenty, believe me, we have plenty. And if you're interested in, in any of the brochures, uh, we, they can be mailed out. If you do want to try to contact us, me and myself, uh, you know, Ben McKnight, and, and I don't think Gene would mind as well. You know, we can, we can get you some brochures. We do have some uh, partner new member inductees, uh, Peace Services LLC out of Brownsburg, Indiana, and accepted on behalf of, of Peace is Kimberly, Kimberly Cottrell. She's the owner. Uh, Peace Services is a pro, uh, provides professional engineering compliance, uh, environmental and 
compliance engineering support, including auditing, uh, permitting, and, and reporting services. Uh, the mission is to provi provide affordable services to a small, medium companies that also want to learn how to grow their business relationship. Uh, the facility, like I said, is located in Brownsburg. Our second inductee would be uh, Elkhart Plastics in the Middlebury facility, Middlebury, Indiana. Accepting uh, on behalf of Elkhart is Jack Welter, uh, Elkhart Plastics president, uh, Josh Quake, the Middlebury site plant manager, and Brian Myers, uh, the compliance manager. Uh, Brian's not on this, uh, but uh, you know he, he's part of the group as well. Uh, Elkhart Plastic uh, was founded in 1988 and is a privately held American company. Uh, they main, manufacture uh, rotational molding plastic parts and are one of the largest uh, custom rotary rotational molding companies in the United States, using some of the most advanced rotational molding equipment in the industry. Elkhart Plastic has three facilities in Indiana. The first who are in South Bend and Elkhart, and they were inducted in 2020. And the induction of the Middlebury plant at the Elkhart Plastic uh, LLC is now as a corporate member. Uh, last but not least is Alonco. Uh, accepted on behalf of Alonco is Mark Danchek, the Senior Director of Engineering Ma Maintenance HSE, Jared Edmond is the Senior Director of Operations of Fermented Products. Casey Schopole is exec Executive Director of Site Head. Michael Clausen is a Senior Director of Manufacturer of API. John Betranis is an Advisor HSE. And Jason Morgan is a Director of HSC. Alonco Clinton manufactures, formulates, and packages animal health products and paras parasiticides. And I, I've been practicing on that one, but it still catches me. Uh, operations began in 1970 while operating in Eli Lilly and company site. Uh, they separated from Lilly in 2019, and they, their approach is sustainability, environmental, social, and governance. Uh, ESG is committed is called Elanco Healthy Purpose, focused on advancing the well-being of animals, people, and the planet. The vision being food and companionship enriched life. Elanco Clinton Laboratories has been a, a member of the ESP since 2007, so virtually from the conception. And then John, you you wanted to, to say something? Uh, sure. On on behalf of our, our site head, Casey Schrumpel, she's on vacation this week. I'd like to, to thank you for the opportunity to join uh, Indiana Partners for Pollution Prevention. And uh, we're looking forward to working with partners to reduce our waste and improve our environmental performance, um, as we've seen improvements through uh, ESP membership also. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And glad to have you aboard. As I had said earlier, our dates are still open for quarterly meetings. Uh, we do have December, and then we have the spring and summer of 2022. Uh, we never thought 2021 would get here, and to be honest with you, 2022 is right around the corner. So if you're interested, uh, you can talk, uh, contact any executive committee member. Uh, you can contact Gene or myself, and we would be happy to help you with this. And here we go, our 24th annual P2 conference, September 23rd, 2021, Unmask Your Pollution Prevention Possibilities. We're live, guys, and we're happy to be there. At Thursday, September 23rd, 2021, uh, tickets are on sale for not only participants, but sponsors, exhibitors, and of course, the general mission. Uh, we have a wonderful conference this year set up. We have some really good keynote speak, or we have a really good keynote speaker, and we have some really good breakout sessions. Uh, along with the governor's award presentations and, and uh, you know, sh short speeches after that. So if you're interested, you'll please uh, go to the link that should have been sent to you and sign up. If you've not received the link, <clears throat> you can locate it on our partner's website and we would look forward to seeing you. 
And I also want to say a special thanks to uh, Steve Jacobson on his new position. Steve Jacobson has been a member of the partners for 12 plus years uh, in the executive committee. Uh, he is moving to Tennessee to manage the Manchester tank and equipment facility after serving uh, over 10 years at the Elkhart facility. Uh, Manchester tank and Elkhart, uh, they're closed. Uh, and so they will be uh, unfortunately removed from the, the partners organization. Uh, those of you that have been a partners for several years, you know, Steve actually hosted an event uh, at their facility in Elkhart. It was a June day and it was still 40 degrees and, but they gave a wonderful presentation and it really enjoyed it. Uh, the executive, uh, he was the executive uh, P2 conference coordinator or register uh, coordinator uh, extraordinaire. He, he did a wonderful job. He did this behind the scenes and there was a lot of work to it and we wish him all the best. Uh, thank you again for hosting, uh, Michael, and look forward to uh, seeing your presentation along with the IDEM regulatory updates and the IUPUI presentation. And so I'll stop sharing my screen for you, Michael. All right, Ben, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that very much. I think next up on the uh, item is Miss Angela Taylor. Uh, she is going to give an update on the uh, IDEM CTAP small, oh, she is the IDEM CTAP small business liaison. She's gonna provide us an update for the next half hour on uh, Indiana IDEM regulatory updates. So Ms. Taylor. Give me just a second, Michael. Do you need me to stop? Do you uh, do you want me to stop sharing my screen, or are you going? No, to you can keep it. Um, I just need a minute. I've got uh, too many things open, so give me just one minute. I know we're a couple of minutes ahead, so just uh, feel free to fill in the two minutes. I'll be you're fine. Able to share in just one moment. Michael, while we're waiting, I really want to thank you for the slide presentation that you gave. Uh, you know, Michigan City is a is a beautiful city. Uh, we actually have a couple people that are uh, going on vacation uh, starting tomorrow through next Monday, and that's where they're going. There you go. And there you, go. you know, I, I really appreciate it. It is. It's just a beautiful city. I, I spent a lot of time up there and hope to get up there and see you. It's still early in the year, so we got plenty of time before the snow flies. Well, you're like I always tell you, you're welcome anytime. And, and uh, you know, hopefully we can get back to the conference on the environment next June, uh, usually the first week or second week in June and get the WG Jackson back here. That's always uh, nice to go out on the lake on that research vessel and, and get some samples and stuff. Uh, I don't know. It's not out of the question yet. We're, we're kind of thinking about maybe trying to have, move it to the fall for this year, but I, I just don't know if that's really going to be able to happen. So. Uh, if, if not the fall this year, which, you know, that's one of the problems. We don't want to uh, step on the toes of the pollution prevention conference, which is in September. And then once you get to October, November, it's, you know, in August is the IWEA conference and September is the pollution prevention conference. And once you get to October, November, it, it, you're really running out of time. So probably next June, hopefully uh, we'll be able to have that conference on the environment again and bring back the WG Jackson and everyone can visit Michigan city uh, again. So yeah. Thank you for the comments, Ben. Yeah. And I can't wait. I mean, I, I, I know we had to cancel last year and, and, you know, I was actually registered to go or we were going to register to go before, until you said you had to cancel everything. Right. And, you know, I, I just look forward to, you know, 2022 to where you can have your conference again. Well, that sounds good. Are you ready, Angela? We don't know what happened to Angela. Now, Michael, on your on the Port Authority and, and the Marina, are mm -hmm. are those boats land stored in the winter time? And, and yes, just, yes, okay. of course, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, you just never know about some people, but I would expect so. 
And this, then, this then picture I, here, uh, oh, it went, where did it go? This picture here actually looks like a painting almost, doesn't it? Uh -huh. it it's so crisp. Uh, it's actually a picture uh, that we took uh, when we were had the W.G. Jackson there and uh, was uh, the fountain and the bridge opened up and I took that picture and it almost, it almost really looks like a painting. If you see these people here underneath the bridge over here on the right, they were waiting to go on the W.G. Jackson and they were, they were over there doing that, so. I don't know what happened to Miss Taylor. Do you think she's having computer issues? Jean or Jennifer, do you have any updates? I do not. Um, I'm just getting ready to text her to see if she's if something's happened. Just a second. Okay. No, that's fine. I did have um, one more picture that I actually that I had in this presentation that I took out that I did share with you before. It was the lighthouse. Uh, it's this picture of the lighthouse here, but with ice everywhere, all over it. You know? Oh wow! It's like, yeah, you kind of think to yourself, it's it's a uh, you know, crazy when that ice uh, gets on there. The whole thing is covered with ice. And we had, uh, and that's why I love that name of that uh, that brew fest. If you get a chance, it's usually in February, and it's called the Shelf Ice Brew Fest. So uh, it's it's uh, usually sells out every year in the first couple of days that they provide tickets so if you get a chance you want to come up in february and enjoy some of the the classic winter weather that's that's a great event to come to no it sounds great i uh great. i don't know what happened to angela she was there and then and then all of a sudden uh she's 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 not there anymore um this first friday event that we have uh this this here on the screen this actually is every every friday uh, from May through September, uh, in starts around, oh, I don't know, four or five o'clock and you walk through the upper arts district and uh, I don't know why that happened. And you, you go into the different, uh, every business along the way, uh, for the most part, maybe not everyone, but almost all of them open up their business and then local artists go into those businesses and set up, uh, art exhibits. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the engineering firms, uh, Haas and Associates is on Franklin Street there, and they have an area where uh, they open up their uh, location for the art exhibits and, um, you know, sometimes some socializing goes on too. Let me let me say that. And uh, a nice thing, uh, you, you do some good interactions some good uh, communication, networking with people, but it's really a nice event. And usually by, uh, you know, seven, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, it starts to wind down and then you can spend the rest of your evening uh, in the city uh, at one of the local establishments or out on the beach. So it's something that if you're planning on coming to Michigan City to, to get here on a Friday uh, or Thursday evening or Friday, that way you can enjoy the first Friday. Now, um, Jessica <clears throat> or... Uh... Dylan, are you available for my UPY? We could always swap presentations and we could actually do the IUPY. And then after break, we could go back to the, the regulatory updates. If you're okay with Michael with that. And, and uh, if Jessica or, uh, or Dylan's on, uh, are you guys on either one of you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gene just DM'd me and asked if I'd be ready to go and I would be. Okay. You wanna, there, you wanna just, now, Dylan? Yeah, let's just swap it. Let's just swap what we were going to do and okay. let's let's go ahead and do the IU presentation because everybody's going to really like this. I, I think it's a really cool idea what they're doing. And uh, then we'll take our break and then after the break we'll see if we can get back to Angela. Great. Yeah, and okay, this presentation is um, pretty short too, so let, that sounds good. Let me introduce uh, let me introduce uh, Dylan Patterson is the Sustainable Landscapes Intern at IUPUI uh, Sustainability Department. And uh, Jessica Davis is the IUPUI Sustainability Director. And um, for those of you that don't know, uh, I had two daughters that graduated from IUPUI and both played on the golf team there. So uh, I have a little bit of a connection. They are the Jaguars. Don't get them confused with the... Uh, Hoosiers or with the Boilermakers, but uh, 
So Dylan, I, I assume you want to uh, share your screen with us. You're going to have a sheet screen to share with us. Yes. Okay. And Dylan's presentation is entitled the electrification of grounds equipment at IUPUI an environmental, social, and economic win. So go ahead, Dylan. Cool. And I'd be down to share my video too. It won't let me do it from my end though. All right, um, let me hide this. Yeah, so it's just a, we're presenting on this electrification process of our grounds equipment at IEPUI. Uh, Jessica, I don't think is in here right now, so it'll just be me. Um, so far, we have started, like prior to this grant, we had begun to transfer some of our more like handheld equipment to 100% uh, electric and it's a partnership with the oh yeah thank you cool hello everyone it's a partnership with a company called greenworks so we started with uh, at one of our annual conferences we had a like an ev experience where they had their equipment out for students faculty and staff to try out and from that we started this transition and these are you know some of the reasons we've been doing that one of the more important ones is that it is uh around our like hospital buildings and our research buildings they have a lot of clean air intake so this equipment allows us to do that that grounds work around those areas as well as to keep doing work on like no zone action days uh, so this project specifically was funded through the idem pollution prevention P2 grant, and it was to replace one of our fully diesel mowers with a full electric version. Uh, so in the in writing this, we had estimated annual savings of 43,000 pounds of CO2, and that was based on our usual daily use of a standard diesel mower. And then we have about a year's worth of data from that. So the mower got 430 some hours of operation, saving around 200 gallons of fuel. And the, the maintenance is where we saw a huge savings with this, <clears throat> excuse me, compared to a gas mower, um, as well as there were no complaints regarding like the use of the equipment from the staff or from the, the like the sound level that was redu reduced from faculty or students. And then there's a uh, just a short quote from uh, our grounds department manager talking about how like the staff themselves appreciates this new equipment uh, and then this is the like cost comparison that came out of this year's worth of data so our our diesel mowers cost around seven hundred seventeen hundred and fifty dollars a year to maintain uh the electric mower required much less uh hourly maintenance on a month-to-month -month basis as well as uh less in moving parts and no cost of fuel. So we're saving around $1,500 a year in the use of this mower. Um, so I'm, I the goal in this was to use this as a kind of case study example at why we should be doing this to fund further efforts in the future. So I'm, I'm confident that this project will have done that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all for this presentation and we I can answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Dylan. Yeah, Dylan. Sure Matt. Dylan, I do have one question. Uh, what was the uh, the battery life on a on a daily basis of this? Could could you actually get through the amount of area that you wanted to? My my understanding is that the mower has like a four to six hour runtime, so I don't think it would be like fully comparable to run all day long. The idea in the future is to have like you know more in the fleet so that they can rotate them out as needed this as it stands was just the, the one that we have no i understand and, and you know i actually uh purchased a new riding lawnmower this year and uh i i i thought about getting you know the the electric because toro and and a few other manufacturers you know are now offering this type of mower uh the problem is is it, 
nobody has anything in stock. You know, there was very few that were made and, and, and I think it was not on purpose, but they just didn't know how many would sell. So, you know, they wanted to go light this year. It appears, you know, I don't, I don't know the total logistics, but they're, they're really not that much more expensive. I mean, you're only talking an extra three to $500 uh, to buy, you know, a, a rechargeable mower. And it's just awesome if you could get on it and turn it on and, and you unplug it, get on it and, and go and not have to worry about the noise and, and everything else that goes on along with that. So yeah. I, I just think it's a phenomenal idea. Yeah, thank you. It, the noise is huge in our, the, in like the small compact areas of campus, and it's it's neat as a like student to walk around and see a mower ten feet from you, and like it's not disturbing any of the space. Um, and I know our our grounds manager talked about they're looking towards like the batteries are kind of moving to being a, a modular system where you can have like a set of batteries, and you know swap them out as needed so that you can last the entire day. Um, I'm not sure what the timeline on something like that is, though. But you know, the, to be a, a to, to be say, a residential type of user for these type of items, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure a couple of people that may be on here that maybe they need something that lasts six hours. But the, I, I think most people, you know, if they had something that that lasted, you know, two to three hours max, that that it would be plenty. Yeah. And and I think it's just a wonderful idea, and, and I look forward to this growing in the future. It's going to save a lot of the, the CO2 issues and it, a lot of the noise issues. Uh, now, did you have any issues with, uh, since it was so quiet that people didn't realize that, uh, that, that it was there? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I didn't hear about any issues like that. And it's, if anything, like our, our goal is to like brand it in IU materials to like make it even more obvious that this is like an effort to electrify our fleet um okay okay no well you know with with being in the industry you know the biggest concern about electric forklifts is they're silent and you get into an area where it's hard for people to see that you know that they actually see it and so i was just curious if that happened or you had anything like that happen there sure this is this is Jessica from IEPUI. Actually, I logged on at the tail end of Dylan's presentation, so good job, Dylan. <laughs> um, I will say that we're we're kind of used to that quiet equipment world because most of our utility carts on campus are electric. Okay. So uh, the they're they're fairly silent. We have a handful that are still diesel that do like kind of heavier jobs on campus, but the folks who are driving them are used to the fact that people are likely not going to hear them. Um, so that's kind of like just a part of our operations and uh, the, in their driver training, like they are supposed to cover that, right? The fact that it's likely that somebody's not going to hear you. So you need to be the one looking out for them. Um, but also I wanted to make one point to like extrapolate out those savings. We tend to keep our commercial mowers. We usually have about a seven year lifespan on them before the, the cost to maintain them kind of outweighs just buying a new one. So right. seven years is like what we've historically used as a campus. So if you extrapolate out that seventeen seventy five worth of savings a year, in seven years, that's $11,000 that you're saving. That's practically a new mower. Oh, yes, um, it is. So, you know, and you know, we'll see what the likes, like it, that seven years may be different, actually, for electric mowers. We'll see once we start getting deeper into this, because really the reason we make the choice is because it's so expensive to maintain the diesel ones over a period of time. We'll see how those maintenance costs change over the lifespan of electric mower. It could be we can hang on to them longer. Um, so we'll see how, how it pans out for us. Yeah, I, I was at, when I found out about this project, I volunteered to, to try one for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I would I would encourage like the municipalities, any big organizations. Like, what really changed it for us is that we basically talked to GreenWorks and we're like, listen, the only way that you're going to get the campus to commit to buying this amount is like you got to let us put it through the ringer. Yeah. So they brought out a trailer full of equipment they asked us what do you want and they let us keep it for two weeks for no charge and just test it and we put it through the ringers our ground not we our grounds team put it through the ringers and they were like yeah you know it, it's a, it kind of built some confidence in them being able to say this is actually going to do what we need it to do even though it's a new product for us so sure. it was after that that free two-week period that then we were able to confidently make our first round of investment into the handheld equipment and then be able to transition to 
you know, the riding mower, knowing the history that we had with the Greenworks commercial line. So, you know, if you're a big city or a big organization and you notice that maybe folks are a little bit timid to make the change, like we can connect you with our Greenworks rep and they deal with a lot of uh, local vendors to actually supply this equipment and, you know, ask for a two week trial period and, and just give it a go. Yeah, no, sounds great. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, I, I know you're muted, but uh, we could actually take a break right now till 1045 uh, and, uh, or 1050. And, and then we could start up after that, you know, with, uh, with regulatory updates, if hey, everything's ready by then. Ben, can you hear me? This yeah, is I Angela. Can... I'm yeah. in the ether. I'm so sorry. Um, I just, uh, I had a, like a total malfunction. <laughs> I could think I had too many documents open and like, yeah overwhelmed my computer and I couldn't <laughs> like get anything to open up or I don't know um do you want me to go ahead and go now or did you want to take a break and I can well I, I mean that way I, I could test yeah everything I think we could take a break and they give you an opportunity to make sure everything's working and, and we yeah I, that until like 10 50 and then if you wanted to go on for your 30 minutes after that and then that would Michael could go. Be it great because it like shut down a bunch of my documents. So I just want to, everything's ready, uh, but I maybe Jennifer can stay on and uh, make sure everything's working on my end okay, uh, okay during the break or one of you guys could. Sure, sure. Are you okay with that, Michael, then? You're the host. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I I'm fine with that. I was trying to see. We were going to take a 15 minute break. Yes. Uh, yes. We, we will take a 15 minute break now. And I also want to apologize to everybody. Um, we were uh, talking here in the office and I was on mute uh, about the boat races that are coming to Michigan <laughs> City in August. And I was trying to find a picture and and edit it up a little bit to show on the screen. And uh, the Great Lakes Grand Prix is from August 4th to August 8th. Uh, I guess everyone saw me doing that editing. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues sent me a text. So I apologize for that. Somewhat embarrassing, but uh, what are you going to do? I, I should have had that in the mayor's slide for sure. So, uh, but it's, uh, we'll take a 15 minute break. It's uh, about 9.30 now or at 10.30 uh, Eastern time, uh, 9.30 Central time. We'll come back at uh, 9.45 Central, 10.45 Eastern and, and, and go from there. I'll open the breakout rooms back open and then I will close them again. So I may have to assign everyone to a breakout room. I'm not really sure, but we'll see how that goes. But the breakout rooms will be back open. Okay, well, thank you. See you in 15. Okay, uh, Angela is here. Uh, she is going to provide her presentation on regulatory updates. Uh, do you need to share your screen, Angela? You should be able to do that, so. Excellent. Let me move the monitor. So it, uh, I think, restored some different version, but let me file play. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, we can. And you can hear me? Yay. Yes, we can. Now, if I can just move this over. Excellent. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Apologies. Um, I don't know if it's the planetary alignments or what's going on, but I think I just uh, totally freaked out my computer. So I'm so glad to be here at the P2 quarterly meeting and especially happy to be with the Michigan City uh, Sanitary District because uh, they presented last year at the Partners for P2 conference and it was absolutely amazing. So 
this is my contact information. And just so you know, this will be posted on our website and all of the hyperlinks work. So you guys can utilize this uh, for your own purposes at a later time. So my name is Angela Taylor. I'm with the Compliance and Technical Assistance Program under the Office of Program Support at IDEM. Here is a map and a listing of some of my colleagues. We have uh, several central office staff, so five of us, and then each regional office has CTAP staff. And I wanted to start off by giving some updates. Um, Julia touched on a couple of these, but um, it is time for us to return to our on-site work locations. Governor Holcomb gave a directive that all state employees need to be back to their pre-pandemic workstations as of July 6th. And as for the majority of us, masks are off effective June 1st per executive order. Masks are no longer required in state facilities, you know, with a few exceptions such as, you know, prisons or hospitals, et cetera. But visitors and staff are still recommended to follow CDC guidance. And, um, but we're so happy we have all these people taking off their masks here and I'm sure that's how we all feel right now. Uh, so IDEM's COVID status, um, IDEM did not relax any policies uh, or issue any broad-based waivers uh, from meeting regulatory re requirements during COVID. However, we have kept a web page and kept guidance documents uh, up to date and implemented some oh, implemented some procedures that we didn't have prior pandemic, such as electronic submittals, et cetera. So um, on this COVID-19 actions page, we recently updated some of those guidance documents related to conducting inspections. And we are gonna keep electronic submittal options available to the public even after everybody goes back. So that is a wonderful thing. And um, this guidance document has been updated with some additional program area um, email addresses and some new cloud-based sharing options for file transfers. So uh, that is the one great thing. Oh, sorry. The one great thing related to the pandemic is it forced us all to get uh, more electronically savvy and create more efficient options. And as people go back, the Office of Water Quality has put out this guidance for flushing water systems to help public water systems prepare their systems for safe use once they reopen in case they've been temporarily closed or utilized less frequently. It's really important to not have stagnant waters. So that's a very helpful um, guidance document. So who's who and what do they do at IDEM? Um, we have had a lot of changes over the past year, uh, notable staffing changes. We've had to say farewell, either due to retirement or people just moving on um, in their career path. Some of the greats that we are very much gonna miss, um, Hala, Class. I, I, she's on the last bullet, but she is um, just such an amazing person and has served IDEM uh, amazingly. She's just, I can't say enough good things about her, but she was the Northwest Regional Office Director and she recently left us to join the EPA. So she joined the federal ranks. Other notable farewells, um, Keith Bogus, the former OAQ Assistant Commissioner retired, uh, along with Bruce Ordle, the uh, Office of Land Quality Remediation Branch Chief. And then we also had to say goodbye to Rebecca Yoniston. Um, she moved on in her career path and she is certainly missed. But with every 
door closing. We have a we have windows of opportunity opening. So some of the promotions or new hires in our higher higher level management positions. Matt Stuckey of the Office of Air Quality has been appointed as the uh, assistant, the new assistant commissioner. Phil, Phil Perry, so he was the former branch chief um, on compliance. Uh, he has been um, appointed to the Office of Air Quality Deputy Assistant Commissioner position. We also had Kevin Davis in the Office of Land Quality. He is now the Remediation Branch Chief. And uh, a newer person, Stephen Phil, he is now the Office of Land Quality Permits Branch Chief. And the Office of Water Quality, uh, I, I made a joke, is playing a game of musical chairs. So the Wastewater Enforcement Branch has moved out from under the Surface Water Operations Branch, which is under Brian Wolf as the Branch Chief, to join up with the Compliance Branch. And so now Compliance and Enforcement are married once again. It seems like this happens every five or 10 years. Um, under Jason House, the branch chief there. And then we have a new staffer, Amari Farron. She is the new section chief for the enforcement uh, section. And then Samantha Gross, who was in that position, moved over as section chief for the inspection section. So those of you that work with items off of water quality a lot, you'll notice there's a lot of shifting going on because Kathy Teachout um, moved over to become the operations section chief. And then Kristen Arnold, she is now the section chief of targeted monitoring under the watershed assessment and planning branch and her former position, section chief of technical and logistical services is currently vacant. So if you know anybody that is interested, please have them apply. We love talented people. Uh, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, and then finally, Anthony Tobias. He is the new section chief of drinking water and compliance support section under the drinking water branch. So if you need to contact any of these people, you now know who is where. So I wanted to give an update on what items been up to lately. Julia mentioned this, so I won't get into it too much, but um, as many of you are probably aware, Senate Enrolled Act 389 uh, was um, passed and that affects items regulatory authority to protect Indiana's isolated wetlands. And um, there is information about that on our featured topics page at IDEM. But there's, I, I clicked on it again. I just got to stop touching, touching my mouse. So um, there are two effective dates in that um, act. And one of them is retroactive to January 1, 2021. But the remaining sections become effective on July 1st. So right around the corner or tomorrow. Um, most permits that have been issued after January 1st of this year uh, shouldn't be affected by the new law and previously approved mitigation plans are going to remain in effect. But if you guys have any question you're incurred about this and if it impacts you, uh, please contact the wetland section at item. So something else exciting, the Indiana Volkswagen Mitigation Trust Program is uh, sent out a request for electric vehicle education, marketing, and outreach program plans. So back in June, they um, met and they established uh, the Environmental Mitigation Trust Fund Committee. Uh, they selected the Indiana Utility Group, and it's comprised of eight Indiana uh, utilities to implement the statewide direct current fast charging, so DC fast program. And 
in that meeting, they also unanimously unanimously supported the creation of an education outreach and marketing program to coordinate with the IUG on a successful rollout and sustainable system for light duty um, electric vehicles. So if you're interested or you know someone that might be, please share that. And then I included the information for um, the VW mitigation trust program and then also the diesel wise because they do have um, additional uh, grant options available this year. So you should, I encourage you to look into that. And then something really exciting that's close to home is um, our clean community challenge program. It's set dormant for quite a while. This is a recognition program and it is going through a complete redesign and it is finally ready to get tested. So we have some pilot projects coming up. So earlier this month, Ida made the announcement about these exciting changes and it's completely revamped. I mean, from the ground up. And all these changes were aimed at removing barriers so that more communities in Indiana could participate. And the whole point of the program is to encourage best practices that improve sustainability and quality of life for Hoosiers in all areas of our state. So IDEM has been working closely with an advisory committee to design and implement these improvements. And the advisory committee is comprised of representatives from the listed groups. So we've got Accelerate Indiana, Municipalities, Indiana Office of Community and Rural, Rural Affairs, Indiana University's Environmental Resiliency Institute, the US EPA, Earth Charter Indiana, and then lots of representatives from other local municipalities. So, this year, we are having, um, we're piloting the expanded project offerings, including all kinds of components like community gardens, curbside recycling, composting, climate change planning, and so much more. It's really a, an expansive list. I'm so excited. Um, so IDEM expects to open membership by 2022. And I have um, listed the pilot communities that have agreed to work in, with this program. And some of these pilot communities will receive an intern at no cost to help implement the sustainable best practices. So it's very exciting. So something else we've been doing while we were electronic, we, um, hosted several new E101 webinar trainings and the recordings of these trainings are available at this link on our website. And the recent ones that were uh, hosted are spill prevention, preparedness and waste disposal. We had um, an overview of national pollution discharge elimination system or NPDES uh, program and air permitting and compliance for grain elevators. And this one was very informative. Cultivating your readiness, how to prepare and handle environmental spills and emergencies in agriculture. And then understanding the basics of reporting to the Toxics Release Inventory or TRI. So all of those are available with just a click on your mouse. Hopefully it won't be as spastic as mine. Um, and they're, they're all really great. And I, we have several more planned to come out through the rest of this year and then ongoing. So um, please check that webpage often. So other things that we have been doing related to electronics is making upgrades to all of our electronic resources and e-services. Um, we have a whole bunch of new things. So one of the most exciting is a new CTAP web portal, which I'll get to on the next slide, but we have also upgraded our maps and GIS system applications, our excess liability trust fund claim status search, 
um, permit and authorization status search. I use this tool all the time. Of course, there's online complaint form is available there. Of course, none of you will ever need that. Um, but then the IDEM public website services have been improved, uh, the public notice notifications, the BFC, and then we have the regulatory services portal. And some of the other services that are offered now is asbestos license renewal web tutorials. We have the Diesel Wise Indiana portal leads, net DMR, and then IDEM regulatory e-portal. So we'll talk about some of those. Most exciting to us, and I'm sure you know why, because it is where my home is, IDEM has launched a new compliance and technical assistance program web portal, and it is hosted through Access Indiana, which I'm sure at least some of you are familiar with. And if you're not, I assure you, you will be becoming more familiar with it because several state agencies are making services available through that. And this portal for CTAP is completely secure. It's an online system that allows the regulated community and other stakeholders the ability to request confidential, is still completely confidential, assistance regarding compliance practices, site-specific assessments, permitting processes, and environmental regulatory topics uh, to the infinite degree. We love challenging questions. So in the CTAP web portal, businesses, companies, organizations, even individuals, we won't turn you away, um, they have the ability to create a personalized secure account and they can easily submit queries electronically so they can ask us any type of question. They can upload documents. They can utilize this service to communicate and track their interactions with CTAP staff. And that gives them the ability to safely store confidential communications and guidance documents. And that reduces the risks associated with email hacks, data breaches or losses, and avoid the ever daunting email searching that I'm sure some of you experience like I do when you're trying to find a piece of information in email boxes with thousands of emails. Um, you can also invite collaborators from within your organization or designated consultants, and you can give them customized permission levels. So you can have them collaborate or just have read-only view rights, and you can have the, allow them to see just one query or your entire um, history. And so that's really great, especially if you're going to go on an extended vacation and, you know, you need your backup to have this information. And you can help us by sharing valuable feedback to the CTAP team through automated surveys. So if you're ready to submit your confidential request, please click on the portal website and um, we'd be happy to connect with you. So as I mentioned, it's through Access Indiana, and this is just some of the agencies that are already connected through their offering services. So you can click on the available services link and find all of these, and Access Indiana allows you to have just one login and one password for all of these services through the state. So we're really, um, advancing. I, I'm so happy the agency is finally making this leap. Darn it. Uh, so our permit and authorization status search that has been updated. And at this time, you can find the following types of authorizations or permits. And so this is really helpful as well. Um, you can see you can find air permits, uh, hazardous waste application, uh, NPDES construction. Well, the Construction stormwater permits, it takes you over to a separate site, but um, solid waste processing permits. So this is really useful. I, you can do a keyword search and, or search by SIC code or NAX codes. And it's really helpful if you're wanting to do a project and you wanna look at other 
um, sources in the same industry sector and, you know, just get an idea of what the approvals might be and what they might look like. So the regulatory services portal, I know these names are kind of all running together, but that is also a secure portal that allows item customers to submit data as required by law permit or regulatory requirement. And the functionality of these services can range from permit application submission to online certification programs. And this is an ongoing project, so they're updating it all of the time. Uh, right now we have industrial stormwater discharges because um, you have to create an Indiana electronic su subscribers agreement and you can get general permits issued through that. And then underground storage tank operator training or IES, um, it doesn't have to go through the IESA, so you can access that. And then in our um, e-services, we also have an online renewal training for asbestos licensing, if that applies to any of you. And you can get your um, contractor license or your individual license, and a, a large portion of it is done online. We have the DieselWise Indiana portal, and that is to provide available funding information, and so you can um, submit the applications, inventories, or reimbursement requests to that program uh, electronically. And then we have leads, which provides access to near real-time data from Indiana's um, air quality monitoring network. And um, approximately 90% of Indiana's air monitoring network is now available to watch in real time. So if you are interested in utilizing that, um, I just noticed the other day that on items main page, they added uh, a whole nother uh, page that says, you know, what's in your neighborhood. And they've added a whole bunch of new mapping tools. Um, and so it makes it really easy to navigate everything from, you know, what's going on with the water body near you to who, who is a hazardous waste generator within your domain. Um, so that's exciting. I didn't get a chance to incorporate that, but uh, next time. So NetDMR is a web-based tool that allows for NPDES permanents to electronically sign and submit their discharge monitoring reports to IDEM. And then the IDEM regulatory e-portal um, is a really fantastic public data search tool for item stormwater construction activity. And you can apply for permits on there, manage permits, pay your fees, um, and submit all your required reports. And it's got maps, it's, it's really great. We also have fairly new, some of you might know this if you're ESP members, because I did present some of this content at that last meeting, but to help expedite the containment and cleanup of any type of spills, IDEM has developed two new web pages. Uh, one is selecting a spill contractor and the other is spill contractor maps. So the so selecting a spill contractor gives you a bunch of guidance about how to choose the right person for your situation and what methodology you should utilize when you're preparing. Because of course you don't want to go there after the fact. You want to have already looked through that and procured someone if you have um, substances of concern. And um, then the site spill contractor map includes contractors who indicate that they maintain 24 hour spill response capabilities using in-house personnel and their own equipment to respond to emergency spills. And so as this gets ever more populated, it's gonna be uh, a great benefit to the environment because we'll get uh, the right people on site as fast as possible. So some P2 opportunities, 
the US EPA has partnered with IDEM and Purdue University's Manufacturing Extension Partnership to offer technical assistance and grant opportunities to Indiana manufacturers. And the available awards were um, allocated for up to 15 Indiana manufacturers, and they would receive what's called a waste stream mapping assessment through Purdue MEP, and it would be at a significantly reduced cost. So as of yesterday, there are currently five spots left. So 10 have already been awarded. Um, so if you are interested at all, this is an excellent opportunity. Participating facilities can get up to 40 hours of follow-up technical assistance after the waste stream mapping. And then participating facilities can apply for seed grant money from IDEM for their project sustainability implementation. So eligibility, any type of manufacturing facility in Indiana, uh, when Purdue MEP comes out, they'll conduct an on-site or virtual, if you're still in that uh, mode at the time, uh, what's called a waste audit. So they evaluate all your usage of water, air, solids, toxics, and energy and help you identify the opportunities available to you to reduce usage, pollutants, and waste. And they'll prepare a report, do a custom action plan. They'll check in to collect data on project status and customize a final report showing your waste and emissions reductions, cost savings, expense reductions, even getting the things that a lot of people overlook. Um, some of the non-tangible items like reduced permitting costs, et cetera. And these typically result in about $10,000 to $200,000 of savings for companies. So um, based on their previous results. So the cost for the company would be $1,500 in company matching funds. And then the US EPA is funding the remainder, which is about $6,000. And then the seed grants, um, the participating facilities, we're gonna be um, allocated approximately $4,500. Um, and item was anticipating six to 10 grants, but I just found out from Jennifer and she could answer any questions you may have about this after the fact that they have just approved a significant increase to the potential funding amounts from IDEM. Um, so you have to already be one of these 15 people. So if you are interested in taking the leap towards sustainability, we strongly encourage you to be one of the remaining five uh, chosen ones. If you have any specific questions about the program or applying for it, you can contact Kelly Weger. I'm sure many of you know her very well, but her information's here. And then I always like to put a plug in for our voluntary programs, um, kind of the, the brother or sister program to the partners is the ESP program or Environmental Stewardship Program. And these, uh, this group accepts applications twice a year, spring and the fall. Jean Fix, who works with uh, the partners group, she is in charge of facilitating the ESP program. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with her, um, but we encourage you to join that group. There are lots of benefits and each program area within IDEM offers incentives for ESP members. So resources for rule policy and um, public notices or any type of notice are listed here. So like I said, all of these links work. Um, and I had mentioned our public notice services have been advanced and then the news and events calendar is very helpful. And I noticed just the other day that it connects to all the other state agency calendars. So there's really a lot of information that you can find there. And that's like a rabbit hole. Um, 
Yeah, Joel, you'll need to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, we're out of your time. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I can't see the clock or anything. So thank you. Um, am I already passed or are you giving me like the three minute warning? I think you have about two more minutes. Okay. Well, that's okay. I got, I, I can go really fast. So next environmental rules board meeting is August 11th. And these are the agenda items. It has been kind of a, a slow rulemaking uh, time frame over COVID, but just recently we had several things um, go through, but what is on the forefront um, are these uh, rulemakings here for adoption, final adoption and preliminary adoption. Um, as some of you probably are aware, all the program area fees are increasing and then um, I guess what would be most useful for some of the groups here today would be um, the financial assurance and the metals criteria regulations. Uh, somehow I got there. I'm gonna skip over that. Um, so this is just a compilation of some P2 financial resources and op uh, opportunities for businesses. Uh, that's one of the biggest challenges for sustainability efforts is getting funding. And um, so I wanted to put this together for you guys to utilize. And then a lot of people find it challenging within their business to get appropriate recycling uh, resources near them and for the products that they may need recycled, including food. The Indiana Food Scrap Initiative has um, really been prolific across the state. So lots of resources available to you. And then if you're not familiar, the US EPA has a ton of wastewater and drinking water resources available now that um, are new. They have all of these resilience uh, resiliency planning. So doing assessments, planning, training, responding, recovery, they've got a whole bunch of new checklists and they have made it really easy to protect your water systems as if there's municipalities listening. Um, I strongly encourage you to go here. And then if you guys ever want to contact us and you're not online, um, you can utilize one of our brochures or share it. So I'm sorry I had to go so quickly. I hope I didn't um, rack anybody's brain too much. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, wealth of information. Uh, a few minutes ago, Jean had put a message in the chat box. If there's any questions for Angela, there are no questions at this point. So I think we will ask you to stop sharing your screen and thank you very much for your uh, part. Okay, um, my pleasure. And if anyone wants more details on the recent rulemakings or the ones that I listed, I have a separate PDF document that I could send over to you guys. The, um, I, when everything crashed, I don't know what happened to the slides I had on those. So, um, but I do have this available if anyone wants more details and links to the rulemakings. We can post that to our website for this meeting. Excellent. Thanks guys. And um, I really appreciate you guys accommodating uh, whatever was happening, the poltergeist in my computer today. No worries. It, it, it's uh, something we've all had to deal with here during the COVID and the Zoom and team meetings and it, it happens. So. Thank you very much again for all your presentation and, and all the energy you bring to, uh, to this organization. Uh, and I'm sure everybody will feed off of that and, and we'll have a really exciting uh, adventurous day after hearing your, your presentation. <laughs> Sorry, well, when, when you're in panic mode, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna relax now. <laughs> you did a very nice job, so, okay. Um, I will uh, continue then uh, with the next portion of this presentation. Um, you, you may want to uh, minimize the uh, speaker screen. I'm gonna have a lot of uh, several slides that are gonna be full screen slides. And if you have that on the, on the screen, you might miss some of that. Um, 
again, my name is Michael Cuss. I'm the general manager here at the Michigan City Sanitary District. Um, I am not, I repeat, I am not the uh, promotional expert for Michigan City, but this was the slide I was trying to work on there that everyone saw me working on it. Just wanted to reiterate, I should have had this in the mayor's uh, opening introduction. The Grand, Great Lakes Grand Prix is going to be from August 4th through the 8th. It's a whole week of festivities. I believe the races are on the 7th and 8th actually. And that combines with the Taste of Michigan City also that same weekend. So if you are planning a trip to Michigan City, uh, the 7th through the 8th might, might be a really uh, good time to attend. So uh, back to my presentation. Um, the Michigan City Sanitary District is responsible for all wastewater treatment. And we have a wastewater treatment facility that is designed to handle an average flow of about 12 million gallons per day. Uh, we are also responsible for all uh, stormwater management, storm sewers, all uh, legal drains, all other ditches, all green infrastructure, and of course, implementation of the IDEM required municipal separate storm sewer system or the MS4 program. Um, we're also responsible for all trash pickup and refuse pickup. We have about 12,000 customers, special pickup, construction debris, and one other real key aspect to the Sanitary District of Michigan City is that the information technology department is also under the sanitary district and we provide all IT related services to the entire city, all of the different departments. And one of the big things that they're working on is a fiber optic installation uh, throughout uh, much of Michigan City to connect all of our departments. Uh, it's also gonna connect our lift stations and so forth. Recently, they've been working uh, diligently on a new whole fiber optic network along Lake Michigan. Uh, in um, anticipation of the boat races, people like to get on the Wi-Fi while they're down there for that. So that's a big project that they're doing. They have, um, they also have some directional, horizontal directional drilling equipment, uh, had a micro trencher for a while. So the, these guys are, are really doing a lot. Uh, our guiding principles are environmental stewardship, sustainability and pollution prevention. Uh, for wastewater treatment, we're gonna talk about our sewer system, our headworks and our preliminary treatment our combined sewage storage basin and treatment, preliminary treatment, secondary treatment, tertiary treatment, disinfection, dechlorination, and post aeration. Uh, then we'll talk about our digester, sludge processing and handling, and then we're gonna give a little plug to our laboratory. So this is an overview of our wastewater treatment facility, an aerial view, I should say. Uh, this is our head works are located in this general area here where the uh, sewage from our community enters. Uh, this is our combined sewage storage basin over here. It holds 6 million gallons. Uh, this is primary treatment. Secondary treatment is in this area. Tertiary treatment. This is your disinfection, dechlorination, and post aeration. This is our all fall 001 from our, our treated uh, effluent. And this is our digestion uh, process over here on the, on the right hand side of your screen. And this is a sludge press where we uh, press our sludge to dewater it, and then our sludge lagoons at the top. Um, and then if in the rare occasion that we do have a uh, discharge from our wet weather treatment facility, uh, that discharge is up here into Trail Creek at All Falls 002. I did not uh, label the creek on this slide, but the creek that you see running through here, uh, this is Trail Creek. Uh, the sewer system uh, in Michigan City is Coverage area is basically bounded by Lake Michigan on the north and uh, Interstate 94 to the south and to the east and also US Highway, or excuse me, State Road 212 on the east and basically to the county line on the west. We are going to be, uh, this is the community of uh, Long Beach, Indiana, along the lakeshore here. We are gonna be adding some sewers there in the near future uh, along Lakeshore Drive. Uh, the collection system is approximately 90 cent 90% sanitary sewers and 10% combined sewers. And since 1962, uh, the sanitary district has, has uh, been actively separating sewers. There is a uh, report that we have where the city engineer in 1962 said, we need to do something about these combined sewers. Uh, we can't have, uh, sewer overflows during rain events going into Trail Creek and out towards Lake Michigan. And that's when the city actually actively began 
uh, separating sewers. And I, I would say it was when they started working on their combined sewer uh, overflow operational plan. Uh, the 2004 combined sewer overflow operational, uh, uh, consign, combined sewer overflow operational plan uh, indicates that the district has spent over $101 million separating sewers since 1962. We've certainly spent more since then. Uh, the long-term control plan was fully approved and implemented in 2004. Excessive combined sewage is stored in uh, during wet weather in a 6 million gallon storage basin. And during dry weather, the captured combined stormwater and sewage is treated through the wastewater treatment plant. Our head works in preliminary treatment. We have flow control that allows for various options based on the flow rate. It has auto controls. We have bar screens, get re grit removal and grit washing. Those are located here. This is the head works of our, of our head works. This is a diagram that may look confusing and that's because it is. Uh, we have two main sewers that come into the treatment plant. This is the 54 inch sewer that uh, trunk line that comes in from the top and it enters this control box, the headworks control valve uh, area. It flows into another control area and then into uh, our main wet well. The 72 inch sewer comes into this control box here and into the second control box and then it flows into the headworks. From the headworks, these are our bar screens and these are our raw sewage pumps. And this is our grit removal over here. Uh, the grit removal and the uh, bar screen material goes to grit washers and classifiers that actually wash the grit before we compact it. And then from the, uh, after it goes through the grit chamber, it goes down to the primary clarifier splitter box. From here under normal flow, uh, the water goes to the primary clarifiers and through the rest of the treatment plant. However, when we do have high flow, the water can be diverted over here to our combined sewage storage basin. Sometimes we just call it the storm basin. Uh, the 72 inch sewer has one unique feature is that it also has a control structure here where it can automatically uh, be diverted directly into the storm basin or the CSSB. Uh, there is a bar screen located before it would go in there. Anything that's captured in the CSSB once the uh, rain event subsides and the flows subside back to uh, what we can handle, um, they are diverted back or returned back to the uh, headworks. And then again, they go through the bar screening again and all through the grit removal again. And again, our treatment facility can handle uh, 12 million gallons on average, uh, 15 million gallons maximum. We tend to push that up around 18 million. Once in a while, we'll try to push through 20 million if we really get in a situation where we uh, need to need to push through flow through, but that's how the head works work. This is a picture of those valves where I was talking about the controls, uh, the valves that uh, can adjust the flow, the different locations. There are some automated valves here. You might be able to see that, see there in the picture. And this is our our bar screens. I have a little video here for you. material that is captured then is, is washed and, and cleaned with the wash water going back into the wet well. And then it comes into this little auger system here. Uh, those plastic uh, bags that you see on those augers was a idea that our operations manager had uh, about two years ago. Before that, the material just dumped into those totes, but with those plastic uh, bags on there, really keeps it in there, keeps it a lot cleaner and a lot better for this disposal into the landfill. And these are our raw sewage pumps. We have four of them. Frequency drives that 
change the speed on the pump slightly if you could add the fire to speed. This is our uh, raw influent flow meter. I believe it's a 30 uh, inch, 36 inch mag meter. And this is the control units. It's a Siemens meter uh, with a calibration factor, whatever that means of 783566. Uh, these are the grit uh, chambers that uh, remove the grit. There's basically two of them. Uh, the water comes in and spins around uh, curves around the curve of the tank uh, at a velocity that's uh, fast enough to uh, keep some solids, the light solids in suspension and slow enough and that the heavy solids will fall out, i.e. the grit that, that comes into our system. Uh, this is a uh, combined sewage storage basin. Uh, information here, the 54 inch sewer receives screening and grit removal before entering the CSSB. The 72 inch sewer flows directly into the CSSB. It can flow directly in there. I did uh, say earlier, there is a bar screen there. They hold 6 million gallons of, of, of wastewater. Aeration is provided. And if an overflow does occur, it receives disinfection and dechlorination before being discharged during the recreational season. And we sample uh, the water for pH, suspended solids, DO, CBOD, ammonia, and phosphorus. And I really, now I see this slide, forgot to add, and for E. coli bacteria also during the recreational season. Okay, why is my slide not working? Advancing. There we go. Okay, this is where the combined sewage storage basin is located. And this is where alpha 002 is located. Uh, again, this is a slide of the, of the basin itself. There are basically three chambers. There's a diurnal chamber, stormwater basin one and stormwater basin two. The original concept was for the diurnal basin to be used all the time, every single day with water flowing in here. And during the diurnal period, you get a higher flow during certain parts of the day and then to come back out. Uh, many years before I got to the sanitary district, they decided that really wasn't the best idea. So now it really stays empty. Uh, it overflows into basin one, which also overflows into basin two, and then which overflows into the contact chamber if necessary, where it's disinfected and then in the yellow portion of the dechlorination. 72 inch, if it needs to come in, uh, does come in right here. Um, our annual report that we have to send into the IDEM and to the EPA every year for the Great Lakes uh, uh, wet weather facilities. Uh, indicates that the Sanitary District of Michigan City had zero CSO discharge events from its wet weather facility in 2020. Uh, this is a listing of the combined sewer overflow events that we've had in the last 11 years. We've had three events in the last 11 years. Um, we had an event, uh, oh boy, we had an event in June of 2013, which was quite an event. I believe we've got about eight inches of rain in uh, nearly about an hour and a half. I think we got four inches of rain in 45 minutes that day. Uh, it was pretty crazy. Uh, but since that event, we've gone one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years uh, with only one other event. And that was in February of 2018. Uh, that was a snow melt and a rain event. And uh, much of Indiana was flooded. There were areas of Northwest Indiana that were flooded for two to three weeks uh, after that event. So uh, very rarely do we have a discharge from this. We're very proud of this. We worked really hard last uh, in May of, of uh, 19, 2019. We almost had another overflow during heavy wet weather. Uh, we worked around the clock to make sure that that didn't happen and, and our, our crew did a great job. So now let's move on to primary treatment. Uh, primary treatment refers to the physical removal of solids from the wastewater by gravity and flotation. After after preliminary treatment, the wastewater is introduced into sedimentation tanks or clarifiers, and solids are allowed to settle to the bottom and float to the top. Uh, the primary clarifiers are located at our facility right here. Uh, this is the splitter box that I talked about earlier that sends the wastewater uh, to the primaries. These are sluice gates here that are normally in the closed position. Uh, they do open up automatically with those automatic uh, actuators on there if the flow gets too high and starts sending water out to the basin. And these are our four uh, rectangular primary clarifiers. Uh, secondary treatment is next. Uh, at the Michigan City Wastewater Treatment Facility, uh, we implement an activated sludge process. 
Uh, this process was developed around 1912 to 1914. It mimics what occurs naturally in nature, but vastly speeds up the process so that clean water can be discharged through our streams. Um, there are a large variety of designs. However, in principle, all activated sludge consist systems consist of three main components, an aeration tank, a settling tank, and return activated sludge. Uh, the biomass in the aeration tanks is commonly called mixed liquor. The solids typically range between 2,500 and 6,000 milligrams per liter, and the dissolved oxygen at the end of the aeration tank needs to be at least one to two milligrams per liter to achieve adequate treatment. Uh, there's many ways to control these. Hydraulic residence time in the aeration tanks is certainly the main way that it's controlled. Other factors that influence this is the BOD and nitrogen loading. Uh, and this is called the food to mac, excuse me, this is called the food to microorganisms ratio or your F to M ratio. And of course you have to have an ample supply of oxygen to keep your microorganisms alive. This is a diagram of, of simplicity, simplicity of the activated sludge system. Your raw sewage comes into the aeration tank. You have a clarifier where the solid separation occurs. The uh, solids settle to the bottom and the clear water is discharged out, is considered your treated water. All your ammonia, all your BOD and suspended solids are all removed in this aeration process. They form a flock and settle down. Uh, the sludge then that settles is actually returned back to the process, hence the name return activated sludge, and then you also waste sludge to sludge treatment. First, we're going to look at the aeration tank system. These are the aeration secondary treatment aeration tanks at the Michigan City Sanitary District. We actually have six tanks. In this picture, it looks like we have 12, and that's because they are two pass tanks. There's actually only six tanks, three tanks on the west and three tanks on the east, or two passes each in each tank. Uh, this is a picture of our aeration tanks on the east side of our facility. Um, we love this building in the background because it's got the old slate roof on it, and uh, we have no intentions of changing that. But these are our six aeration tanks that are on the east side of our facility. Um, these are our blowers that provide the oxygen and the air to our aeration tanks. Now let's take a look at the clarifier or the side, uh, clutter clarifiers secondary clarifiers. These are our clarifiers. We have eight circular clarifiers that handle the flow from the aeration tanks. Both east and west flow here. And then the recycled sludge, that occurs in these buildings here. Uh, one of the buildings doesn't really have a roof. It's down below ground. They're down, down low, obviously, because your, your solids settle. And then the second building, the one with the slate roof. This is a picture of our return activated sludge pump. And then the waste sludge that's sent to the digesters. This is a, a picture of our waste activated sludge pumps. And then the waste activated sludge uh, from this facility is sent to what's called the dissolved air flotation unit. The um, dissolved air flotation unit, what it, what, how it works is uh, compressed air is entered into the system and it forms bubbles, millions of bubbles, and it actually helps float the sludge to the top and it, and it sits up on the top and those rakes skim it off. And if you couldn't hear me very well, what you want to see on those systems, if you're ever conducting an inspection of them, is you want to see relatively clear water being discharged out. Our water there looked really well. Uh, if you see a bunch of solids coming in, then you know it's not working very well. And these are the air vessels.
maintenance is over $100,000 compared to the new equipment. And while we're in this building, the primary treatment from the primary clarifiers that we showed you before. I did make uh, one error there on that video. Uh, those pumps pump sludge to the digesters. I think I said to the aeration tanks, they pump the sludge to the digester. Uh, and those um, pieces of equipment are located right in, in this building, which is our DAF and our primary sludge pumping building. Uh, now let's move on to our tertiary sand filtration. Uh, sand filtration involves passing secondary effluent uh, through uh, treated wastewater and a stationary bed of granular media consisting of silica sand. This is our sand filter building. And then the Secondary effluent going That last slide was the filter cell effluent after it goes through all the filters. Um, we've got that area. And then also uh, you had been thinking about putting a little uh, turbine on that to maybe try to generate some electricity from that because that flow is, uh, is pretty constant uh, all day long. Uh, the next thing we'll look at is uh, disinfection and dechlorination and post aeration. But before I move on to that, we're gonna talk a little bit more about these filters when they, when they fill up uh, they have to backwash and clean themselves. So they air scour themselves and that water goes into a mud well. We call it the mud well or the backwash well, and then it's pumped back to the plant. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that later on in the presentation. But now on to the disinfection, dechlorination and post aeration. Uh, the gaseous and sulfur dioxide storage room is located over here in the center part of the plant. And this is a picture of our ton cylinders that uh, we store our chlorine room, this is our chlorine and sulfur dioxide room, they're stored in that building. And then the feed for the chlorine and sulfur dioxide is way over here on the other side of the plant. This is all done through a vacuum feed system. Uh, and uh, we have a line that goes all the way from the first box I showed you all the way over here. And then this is inside the feed room system. This is some of the piping uh, of that. This is our rotameter for our chlorine uh, gaseous feed, and this is our sulfur dioxide gas feed uh, rotameter. And then these are our chlorine contact tanks. We have about a 30 minute to one hour detention time in there. We try to maintain the residual chlorine at the end of the contact tanks around one milligram per liter, sometimes a little higher, especially, uh, usually we try to maintain it around 1.5 milligrams per liter. We wanna make sure we get kill as much E. coli bacteria as we can. And normally we're down around the detection limit or uh, undetected amounts of E. coli. From the sand filtration building, the filtered wastewater flows into these two circular chlorine contact tanks. This is 
salt tank, and now it's a dwarf tank. This is our superintendent, Mr. Mullerad Milanovich, that certified operator. He's going to grab a sample and show you what this water looks like in the sample container. Mr. Milanovic. Let's take a look at the post aeration and then the uh, creek. Uh, that water is very clear. Uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, I've always said, uh, even before I worked here, uh, the last place you want to do a wastewater inspection at on a uh, 95 degree, 80% uh, humidity day is Michigan City Wastewater Treatment Facility because those chlorine contact tanks look like swimming pools. And it's all you could do to not want to jump in and cool yourself off. So uh, we're very proud of that. From there, it goes over to uh, dechlorination and post aeration. This is our post aeration chamber. charging out to Trail Creek. So at this point, the wastewater has been filtered and chlorinated and the chlorine has been removed. And then we monitor the DO uh, dissolved oxygen of our effluent uh, continuously uh, with this meter here. At the time of this video that I took earlier this week. Uh, I believe I took that video on Monday. Our dissolved oxygen being discharged out to the creek was 8.42 uh, milligrams per liter. And our limit is a seven on a daily average is seven. So we're well above that limit. Uh, this is where I'll fall here. 001 enters Trail Creek right here. on this alcohol structure are to prevent sand from swimming up into our final left foot. Typically, if you come down here, you can see large mouth bass swimming near our alcohol. And this is our uh, compliance record here for May of 2021. Um, our suspended solids and our ammonia were below our detection level every single day in May. Uh, BOD was uh, bounced around uh, below and just at the detection level a couple of times uh, getting over that limit. Uh, the percent removal for the overall treatment at the bottom for the BOD for May was 98.9% removal. Uh, suspended solids was 99% uh, removal and ammonia was 99.4% removal and phosphorus was 92% removal. Uh, at our Phosphorus um, limits that we have coming in were required to meet 80% removal. And as you can see, we're, we're well above that. So the treatment plant does a really nice job. Uh, we rarely have any exceedances. I, I can't really even remember the last time that we had one. And you could just see here the treatment efficiency that we receive at this facility is, is, is really great. Uh, now let's look at the digesters and sludge processing and handling. We'll go back to this part here. We showed you the DAFs and the sludge pumping, this is where they pump to the digesters. This is what this looks like on a schematic. 
You've got the primary clarifier sludge here. The waste activated sludge goes to the DAF unit. Those are pumped into two uh, primary digesters, primary digester one and primary digester two. We alternate these feeds on a mathematical calculation that works out amazingly perfect based on the size of these tanks. So they receive an equal amount of flow each day. One thing about the digestion process, it works very well, uh, much like our stomachs work where we digest our food, that's how these work. They're digesting the, the organic waste. Uh, you wanna feed them at a constant rate and you wanna keep them happy and healthy with the constant temperature, with no upsetting, uh, you know, you go a long time without eating, you get upset. So you wanna have some food coming in almost all the time. From there, the digest, the digest sludge flows to a secondary digester, which really is not a digester. It's a misnomer, it's more of a holding tank. And from there, it flows into our holding tank and supernate, uh, oh, and then sludge then goes to the belt press and the supernate from the belt press and the sludge holding tank go back to the head of the plant. And the sludge cake goes over to our drying lagoon where we store our dried biosolids and then our dried biosolids are taken out to the landfill for land application. Uh, we recently started working with a new farmer and um, I called him on the phone uh, last week to ask him how things were going with the land application that we applied uh, back in April and May. And he was saying that him and his father and uh, his brother were looking at the field where they had put some uh, of our municipal sludge on and Part of the field they hadn't put any sludge and he said it was amazing you could see the difference in the corn growth in the areas where they had the sludge applied so they're very happy with it it's a beneficial reuse working very well great program uh, and, and they want as much of our uh, sludge as they can get uh, this is di a picture of digester one this is a picture of digester two uh, this is the mixing pumps you have to mix these digesters so they're not just sitting still so one of our Vaughn mixing pumps that mixes the sludge in the primary digesters. Uh, these are pictures of our heat exchangers. Basically they're boilers that boil a, a closed loop of water. And then the sludge is sent through the heat exchanger and warms up the sludge. We try to keep that around 95 degrees. This is a close up of the heat exchanger uh, to the north. We have two of them. We operate both of them all the time, but we try to keep the sludge right at 99 degrees. Uh, this is our secondary digester. Again, I put digesters in quotes. It's where we store our gas uh, that comes off the primary digesters on this floating cover. This cover on, on the top moves up and down on those rails and it twists as it moves. Uh, this is our sludge holding tank where we draw off for our sludge press. And if you notice our gas is piped over there, uh, this is where we burn excess of gas. Our, those heat exchangers that I showed you earlier, these actually burn off of digester gas. We can use NIPSCO natural gas if we need to, but they burn off the natural gas. So it's basically a closed loop system that self-sustains itself, uh, a good classic pollution reduction uh, situation right there. This is one of our electric carts that we have, many electric carts, uh, we have four of them. Uh, this is the one everyone likes to drive because it's the fastest of the four. Uh, these are street legal, we take them on the streets sometimes, they're very nice to go down by the beach. And this is parked in front of our sludge press room. Uh, the press sludge uh, goes into a dump truck and then the dump truck is driven around across the bridge to the other side of the creek 
where the dried sludge is put into the sludge storage lagoon. These are rows here of the sludge that you can see. We put them in rows like this to keep them dry. And then uh, we load them into our, our, our dump trailers uh, and our dump trucks again, and we take them out to the farm field for land application. Uh, last, I'd like to point out our laboratory. Our laboratory is located right over here by our digester building. Um, our laboratory is accredited through the American Association of Laboratory Accreditation to the International Organization of Standardization, uh, 10725 Testing Slash Calibration Laboratories. Uh, this provides full regulatory requirements and compliance and demonstrates competence and integrity to our stakeholders. And Michigan, the Michigan City Sanitary District is the only, I repeat, the only municipal laboratory in the state of Indiana that is accredited through the A2LA Association to these ISO testing and calibration standards. This is a copy of their accreditation certificate. Uh, this is a picture of, of the laboratory uh, from one of the angles. And this is their latest baby that they just received the last week. Uh, they were having problems with the dilution water. So we purchased them a reverse, mos reverse osmosis milliq system to create uh, new dilution water. Uh, I understand this thing is working excellent and produces water a lot faster than our old still used to produce uh, the dilution water. So, so far, so good with the new system. Um, this is a picture of our, of our lab techs. Uh, in the front is uh, Sue Lehman. She's the lab director and quality manager, uh, followed by Laura Pearson, and then Fawn Patterson, and then Katrina Vito is uh, with her hands on her hips with a nice smile there. Um, we're very sad to report that uh, Fawn has left us uh, to go work for some uh, organization, uh, I don't know, fly by no organization or something called the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, something along those lines. Uh, but she's left us to go work for them. Uh, she's going to actually be a drinking water inspector in the Northwest uh, Regional Office. Uh, we're actually very sad to lose her. Uh, she's a very nice young lady, and I'm sure she will do a great job at the IDEM, and I'm sure they will be very happy to have her. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't point out uh, the gardening expertise of our laboratory. Typically, they have a nice vegetable garden over in this area, but this year they decided to plant a couple of flowers, and it looks like they're going with pumpkins this year. That seemed to be a nice, healthy crop. Uh, this is our administration control building. Uh, excuse me, not our administration, our operations uh, control building. And inside this building, this is a picture of our new video wall that we've installed the, oh, I don't know, I think it's been in operation for six months now that has uh, all of our operations on it. In this screen, you can see the effluent DO. If you look close enough, you can see at the time of this picture, which was taken a, a day or two after the picture I took on uh, a Monday, I guess I took this maybe yesterday, the DO was up to seven, 8.72 milligrams per liter. Then we've got the headworks, and then you've got your blower building and your effluent building, your filter building and your secondary clarifiers. Um, this is a new a Wonderware system, uh, which is a SCADA system that we've been working on. Uh, it's just about ready to be finalized, but it's been super helpful. We can get all kinds of trends now and everything that's going on with our facility. Uh, this is where that operations control building is located. Now I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about uh, pollution prevention initiatives that we have going on here at the Sanitary District. Switch gears just a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about CNG refueling, LED lighting, capacitors, VFD drives, high efficiency blowers, actuating valves, and a little bit of process control. I guess I need to click on my screen again to get it to go. We have a CNG refueling station with two 40 horsepower compressors. We have seven CNG fueled light trucks, uh, four CNG fueled trucks, one CNG fueled sewer cleaning machine, and uh, three CNG dump trucks. Um, and we also have one CNG, uh, actually two uh, CNG garbage trucks. I don't know why they're not listed on my little uh, list there. Uh, we estimate the reductions from using CNG from these to be about 179 pounds of VOCs per year, 614 pounds of carbon monoxide a year, and 8,000 pounds of carbon dioxide per year. This is a picture of our uh, compressed natural gas refueling station. These are the two compressors on the left and the four storage spheres on the right. Uh, this is a close-up of the compressor. 
This is a picture of one of our CNG uh, natural gas vehicles, uh, dump, uh, pickup truck. Uh, this is a picture of, of our refuse, one of our refuse uh, CNG trucks. This is a picture of our CNG fueled uh, sewer cleaning machine. And this is a close up of how they're fueled. It's a little bit different than going to the gas pump, but not too much different. And uh, if you look back at this picture here, this is actually the fueling station, refueling station that we constructed here at the district, did all this work ourselves, engineered in, in house and constructed in house. So that was good. That's how you hook it up. And this is a picture of our three new uh, CNG dump trucks that Mayor Perry discussed in his opening remarks. Uh, that's Johnny Dean on the left, uh, St. Louis Cardinals fan, don't hold that against him. Josh Barnett in the middle, he's our runner, he runs every day at lunch. And Jermaine Woodard on the right, uh, he's a Dallas Cowboys fan, so please don't hold that against him either. Uh, but these are our three new um, CNG jump trucks, they seem to be working really good. Uh, LED lighting. Um, we uh, installed out new LED lighting throughout our facility. It's a picture of LED lighting in the building, one from the outside and the LED lighting that we have uh, a close up of. I wanna say one more thing before I forget the CNG vehicles. Uh, we were able to piggyback on the diesel wide program uh, on a, several instances. So uh, that helped us out with some of the funding on that through, this, through IDEM. Uh, we appreciate that and the Volkswagen mitigation grant to, uh, I think we got $140,000 to help out with those two uh, those three dump trucks. Uh, more recently, we've added new capacitors to the main power feeds and the variable frequency drives in the non-potable water system. Uh, these capacitors are excellent. Uh, you have a power factor rating, and if you don't keep your power factor at a certain level, you pay a surcharge on your on your energy bill. Since we put these uh, power these capacitors in, we've never once had to pay a surcharge. They're very very good. Uh, this is a variable frequency drive on our non-potable water system that's helping us save money. Uh, these are our high efficiency blowers. These are our old blowers that we used to have positive displacement blowers. Uh, this is what it looked like when they were removed. And this is the new high efficiency turbo blowers, the Salzer blowers that are installed. It's a close up of the Salzer blower. Another close up, blower four on your right and blower five on your left. Uh, we removed old blower four and old blower five. So that's why we kept those mains. Uh, process control. In 2020, uh, we installed new backwash uh, pumps from our mud well and automatic controls in our sand filter building. Uh, these together have reduced backwashing by approximately 60 to 70 percent. Uh, these are some of our controls. Uh, they look very antiquated, but uh, actually they, they work uh, very well. Uh, these are floats in the, air, in the filter cell themselves. When the floats rise and they tip, uh, these controls here uh, send the cell into backwash mode, and then it will backwash that filter. If two filters come up at the same time, the system is sophisticated enough that it will hold off on the second backwash until the first one is done, and then the second one will backwash. Um, these are some uh, height level controls we put on each cell. They do not operate the cells. All they do is provide height measurement uh, back to our to our uh, to our SCADA system. I just want to say. Uh, that uh, when we installed these pumps here, we used to backwash the filters. Every cell we used to backwash just about once a shift. So we have three shifts, so about 30 backwashes a day. Now we're down to probably an average of around 10 backwashes a day, maybe eight, eight backwashes I meant to say a day. And we've actually had days where we've had one to two to three backwashes for an entire day. Uh, but on average, that's reduced um, the backwashing, which uses energy for the air and also uh, the pumping of the backwash water back to the head of the plant. So that's a considerable saving. Actuating valves. This is a valve we put on our post aeration. Remember the bubbling of the after the chlorine contact tanks. What this does is it's hooked up to the, um, to the DO meter. And if the DO drops below 8.5, this valve opens to send more air to the uh, post aeration tank. And if it goes above 8.5, it closes down to its minimum set point. Uh, typically, we've been seeing uh, DOs in the 8.7 to 9 range. Uh, that one picture that I did have was a little below 8.5, uh, but the valve had just opened, and, and that's why you saw a lot of bubbling there and keeps the DO right uh, well above our limit of 7.0. Uh, 
This is an actuating automatic valve we put on our coarse air system. We have between the aeration tanks and the clarifiers, we have what's called the aerated channel, or I like to call it the bubbler channel, where we bubble air in to keep the solids in suspension before they head into the clarifier. And this valve regulates the flow through that aerated, through those aerated channels or bubbler channels. We try to maintain that at about 650 uh, cubic feet per minute of air. So what was happening before is when we were calling for more oxygen aeration tanks, the blowers would ramp up and send more air to aeration tanks, would also send more air to the aerated channels where we didn't need it. And so this actuating valve is helping us save money. Now our next big energy savings project is the uh, is our um, automated actuators on our air, excuse me automated actuators on our aeration tank air valves. Uh, this is a picture of our four of our six aeration tanks, and this is a 24-hour graph of the dissolved oxygen level in each tank, with the dotted line in each tank across the bottom being our set point of a minimum of two milligrams per liter set point. As you can see, tanks four five, one, and two, and even three, were all higher than two for the better part of the morning, while tank number six was hovering around two, dropping just down below two on several occasions. So what we want to do is we want to be able to automatically close the valves on the tanks that are higher and open the valves on the tank that is lower so we can get the air to the tanks that we need it. As the day progressed, as you got later in the day, you could see that tank one drop down below two and tank two also dropped down below two slightly tank four on a certain a couple occasions and uh but tank three and tank two excuse me tank three and tank five still stayed well above uh the two milligram per liter threshold so again we're hoping that we can drive more air there and why do we want to do that this is a graph of our blower speed our minimum set point right now is 60 percent blower speed uh, those of you that participated in the uh, September 2020 Pollution Prevention Conference might remember my presentation where I talked about mixing and how important you need to have proper mixing in your aeration tanks. It's extremely important. And our amount of air that we need, if you use the theoretical calculation, we really need to have our blowers up above 70 percent, 72 to 75 percent is the amount of air that we really need for minimum mixing to be safe. Um, we, since we've implemented this energy savings program, we have not really seen, even though we're going to show you, we've seen some great savings. We have not seen the type of savings that we were really hoping for. This is one of the reasons we've lowered our minimum speed down to 60%. And so far, it hasn't hindered our treatment too much, but we are getting some buildup of some foam and solids in our in our ration tanks. And then uh, when the DO drops below two, the blowers ramp up. And that's when you, if you remember uh, back to this chart here, where you can see it going up and down below the two uh, threshold, that's where the blower is picking up speed. And once it reaches the two, it's coming back down to its 60% mixing. Later in the day, when you had this tank and this tank and tank six hovering around the two milligram per liter limit, as you can see, the blower had to kick up to even a higher speed. If one blower is not enough, a second blower will kick on. On this particular day, which was June 10th, we had 151 uh, kilowatts. That was our average power for the day, 151 kilowatts. So what we're hoping to do here is we actually have 24 valves that control the air to these six tanks. Uh, we've got tanks one through uh, six, and each of them have four valves aptly labeled 1A, 1B, 1C, and 1D. The maroon color is your treated flow. Uh, this is your two pass system that I talked about. And then these are our blowers down here with our aeration feed. So we're hoping to control these valves such that we can get the air to the tanks that we need it in. Our control scheme is basically gonna be uh, a minimum set point of 20% on every valve, no matter what, and a maximum of 100. Every two minutes, we're hoping to take the average of all six tanks if the DO of every, if the DO of each tank is within two milligram, 0.2 milligrams per liter of the average, we will not have the actuator move. If the DO is greater than 0.2 milligrams per liter in that specific tank, we will close the actuator 2%. And if the DO is less than uh, 0.2 milligrams per liter from the average, 
we will open the valve 2%. We're hoping with this scheme that we can get the DO and all the tanks to be more constant and also be above that two milligram per liter threshold for longer periods of time, therefore allowing us to operate our blower at our minimum mixing set point for longer periods of time and saving energy. Uh, this is a, a, a uh, drawing of our plant, actual engineer drawing that shows the control wiring that we're going to need. We worked on this, we ordered the control wiring and it actually was arriving uh, today. As a matter of fact, we just ordered it last week. It's pretty amazing. Uh, that was a $23,000 order right there just for the control wiring and the conduit. Um, and this is a picture of one of the actuators. They arrived at our facility, we ordered these a long time ago. They took six months to get here, or excuse me, about, about eight weeks to get here. And they uh, arrived on Thursday. And as of yesterday, all 24 were installed by our maintenance crew. They did a fantastic job of uh, taking these apart, uh, the old valves apart, which wasn't easy, old hand crank valves and installing these. Uh, we're hoping that we can reduce our average uh, kilowatt hours with these by about 20 to 30 kilowatts on average from a range of 140 to 150 kilowatts, maybe down to 120 to 130 kilowatts. If we can uh, reduce it by an average of 20 kilowatts a day, uh, our, average, our average usage, that'll be 480 kilowatt hours per day or 175 thousand kilowatt hours per year or an eight thousand dollar savings if we can achieve the 30 uh, kilowatt average reduction we believe we can knock down about 262 thousand kilowatt hours a year or save about twelve thousand dollars a year uh, pollution prevention reductions at the 30 kilowatt hour average we think we can reduce so2 about 0.21 pounds per year NOx about 0.33 pounds a year and carbon dioxide about 438 pounds a year uh, let's talk about energy use reductions overall. Uh, we have in 2018, since we've instituted these energy savings projects, we have uh, reduced energy by uh, 600,000 kilowatt hours. In 2019, 800,000 kilowatt hours. And we are so proud of this in 2020 uh, with all the reductions that we've implemented so far. You can see we're driving this number higher and higher with our energy savings. We've saved over a million kilowatt hours. And let's look at that in cost savings. That's about a $56,000 savings in 18, about a $70,000 savings in 19, and about a $90,000 in savings in 2020. Uh, that's a credit to all of our staff, our engineering staff, operation staff, maintenance staff. And we probably ought to even throw our financial uh, uh, director into the mix because he's the one that allows us to uh, issue these purchase orders. Uh, and the pollution, present, pollution reductions, we use this uh, 0.9 pounds of SO2 for every million uh, megawatts. Uh, and we use uh, 1.3 for every me million megawatts and 1,671 uh, carbon dioxide for every megawatt. Uh, in 2019, these are the reductions you see in 2019. In 2020, these are the reductions you see from this reduced energy use. And the totals for 2019 and 20, we reduced SO2 by 1,655 pounds. We reduced uh, NOx by 2,319 pounds, and we reduced carbon dioxide by over 3 million pounds. I probably better say it now because I know it was brought up. Uh, how we get these reductions is the energy that we use, the electrical energy that we're saving, the power plant, the NIPSCO plant in our community does not have to generate this much electricity. Therefore, the air pollution that they would put out through their coal-fired trip facility is this much less because they didn't have to produce this much energy. So that's how these savings uh, air pollution reductions are actually occurring. Um, rebates, we received a $173,000 rebate from NIPSCO when we installed the new blowers. And this is a real key to the compressed natural gas. We're actually receiving a rebate, even though we don't pay taxes, we're still receiving a rebate each year from the IRS. Uh, it was about $9,000 in 18 and uh, right around $10,000 in 19 and 20. So we've, saved, we've received a rebate for the last three years from the IRS of $29,000 rebate just for operating our CNG vehicles. What they do there is they look at how much natural gas you've used and so on and so forth. Uh, it's not like they just cut you a check. It's a report you have to file with them. 
they've been very easy to work with so far, and we've already got our first quarter check for 2021. Uh, now I want to look at a couple different things. I want to look at our uh, some stormwater pollution prevention, uh, the Carwick dump site, uh, the Cheney Run stormwater wetland facility. We'll talk about pollution prevention and pollution reduction. And when I get to the Cheney Run site, uh, Ted Blanick, who's the design engineer from V3, I've asked him to jump in uh, for one of the slides. So let's hope he can let's hope he can accommodate us. Um, let's talk about uh, the on the right hand side of this picture. Uh, this is Trail Creek flowing through the middle. Uh, the Carwick dump site is on the right, and this is your Cheney Run stormwater wetland facility on the left. Why are these so important? Uh, you will see about the car, former Carwick dump site, and the Cheney Run is a stormwater pipe that treats storm, or excuse me, conveys stormwater from a large portion of Michigan City, and it just used to be an open pipe that went out to Trail Creek, an open pipe, then an open ditch that went straight out to Trail Creek, and what we did there was we dammed it off and created a uh, a wetland treatment facility. So let's start out with the Carwick site. It received significant amounts of household refuse, demolition debris and material. Uh, illegal dumping occurred here from 1965 through 1971. This is where it's located on a map in Michigan City. Uh, you've got Lake Michigan here, and this is Trail Creek that winds through here and makes this curve and then comes out here to the uh, creek. Our wastewater treatment plant is located uh, right around in this area here. Uh, this is an aerial view uh, of the Carwick site on the on the right or on the red uh, trapezoid there, and then this is the Cheney one run to the left. And this is uh, a manufacturer called GAF. We'll talk a little more about them in a minute. Uh, this is what the Carwick site looked like in 2013. Open dumping occurred along the banks of Trail Creek. It's a 10 acre site of dumping. It's not just along the creek and a heavy rain event caused erosion along the shore. And this is what we found. A couple really classic pictures, uh, very disgusting. Uh, what we did at that time was we implemented emergency control measures. Uh, I know a lot of times when you do work along creeks and stuff, you have to get a lot of approval from IDEM and IDNR. Uh, we did the work first and we told them, look, we had to avoid a disaster. We came in and put down some netting and, and did some work. That's a whole other story that I don't want to get into right now. Uh, they were very blessed with the work that we did. Uh, after we did that initial stabilization, uh, we developed a Carwick Corrective Action Plan. Uh, this was developed by Weaver Consultants. What this did was it installed a, uh, first of all, it pulled back part of the bank along the, the creek and leveled that out a little bit. And there were some significant drop-offs along here, maybe about even uh, eight to 10 feet drops near the creek. We installed a, collect, a leachate collection system along the creek to handle the leachate water and put a pumping system in for that. Uh, remediation costs were about $2.4 million and we've got post-corrective care for the next 30 years of about $800,000. Uh, you saw those earlier pictures. First thing we had to do is cut down a bunch of the trees that had grown in there over the years. There are a couple of pictures of that. These are some pictures of the refuse that we found when we started moving some of the dirt. As you can see, this is where they pulled back the creek bed or the creek bank and sloped it properly. And it's just full of garbage, absolutely full of garbage. And uh, this is a newspaper from November of 1969 uh, that we found while we were digging through there. And this is a classic picture here. Uh, we found uh, several, I don't know, probably at least maybe seven to 10 plastic baby dolls in this dump when they were pulling back the uh, earthwork there. And this is a classic picture of one of the classic baby dolls that, uh, you know, spending the rest of its life in an open, an illegal open dump uh, downward, uh, just kind of a classic picture. Uh, this is what it looked like after uh, we brought in some uh, clay and dirt on top of the water that was or the dirt that was pushed back and along the creek bank here is underneath here. I don't have pictures in this slide presentation is where the leachate collection system is. This is the lift station that pumps the leachate collection system back. This is some work uh, along the shore. This is what the site looked like prior aerial. This is what the site looked like now aerial. And this is what the site looks like today. These, this video was taken last Thursday. Or this picture was taken last Thursday. The grasses are coming in. 
Uh, we've got new trees that are being planted. And uh, this is another view of Trail Creek. Looks a lot better than all the garbage. And what we've got here, we've got three fishermen. We're gonna show you three fishermen. The guy on the left is old school. He's got his t-shirt and his rod. And the guy on the right looks, uh, to me, reminds me of Howard Sprague and the Andy Griffith show. He's got every possible piece of equipment known to man there with him. I even joked around with him when I took this picture. But the third guy, he's got the keeper right there, right there on the shores of the old Carwick dump site. He's got this classic steelhead picture. It was like perfect timing. We went out there to get some pictures and here this guy reeled in this, uh, this, this salmon. So it was really good, really good. Um, this is uh, the Cheney Run now. We're gonna move on to the Cheney Run. Uh, this is a picture of the Cheney Run channel on the opposite side of the creek where it used to discharge out. Uh, this is an area of where the Cheney Run, the drainage area, as you can see a large portion of Michigan City, all drains and all funnels right out here to the Cheney Run outfall. This is what the outfall used to look like before we did our recent work. And this is where it entered into Trail Creek. There was some trees that had fallen down, but this nasty brown, dirty water was coming right into Trail Creek. Uh, Ted, this is the slide I have for you. If you want to talk a little bit about the design of the, um, the V3 design, if you're there. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. Okay. Well, I, I can't point the stuff, but if you look at the, um, look at the map, the, the western half of the, of the wetland was already a wetland. Um, it was full of a lot of invasive species, Phragmites mainly. Um, so part of the project, we went in there and cleaned a lot of that out, I'm trying to clean all of it out. Um, and then we're, we created this eastern half, which basically expanded the wetland by, I think, about seven acres. Um, and we did that not by digging the area out, because there's a lot of trees out there, big trees out there already. We just raised the water level with this uh, pedestrian weir, is what we call it, because there's, there's a trail that goes over it. And the water does not flow over the top of that. Uh, or it's it, it better not. <laughs> so uh, that backs the water up and it, it really enters the wet one way down here at the western end. That's kind of a low spot. And it flows through, um, this shows a low flow channel, but really it's, it's, it's moving through as sheet flow to a, um, a discharge at the northeast corner. Um, there's two discharges. There's a subsurface pipe that the water has to, it's kind of like a farm tile. Water soaks in and, go, and pops out the pipe. Um, and then the majority of the flow right now is going over a stone weir. And that's primarily because we've had a pretty wet spring. Um, and uh, there you go. Uh, the site's been planted um, with a whole bunch of understory plants uh, and emergent wetland plants. Looks really nice. We just finished the plantings, I think, uh, a couple weeks ago, right, Michael? Yes, sir. Yeah. So it's ready to go. We've got a real nice uh, trail trail system that kind of takes you from Carwick across the bridge and then back into the woods. And we one of the neat things about that trail, if you ever get out there, uh, we used a material called Flexipave, which is uh, made of recycled rubber tires and a urethane cement. And the reason we picked it, it costs a little more than regular asphalt, but in the 20 years they've been using it, they've never had to go back and make a repair. So, because we really can't get back there again to fix anything, we kind of had to work our way backwards out of the site. It was important that we use a material that uh, was gonna last, well, a long, long time, if not forever. Thank you very much, Ted. I'll show yep. some pictures of that. Uh, staying on this slide for a second, up here we've got this parking area that's on the Carwick side. Uh, this trail portion has not really been built yet. You have to find your way across the new uh, portion of Carwick. And then this is the bridge we talked about that enters in there. So let's take a look at that now. Uh, this is the uh, Carwick side here at the bottom. And you go across the bridge and you're going over to the Cheney Run side. And this is what it looks like when you come down from the bridge. And this is some of that flexi paved trail that, that Ted talked about. Beautiful design of this trail. Uh, we can get in here with some equipment to do some maintenance if we need to over that bridge. Uh, this is an area of the wooded uh, wetland. It's very beautiful back there. Again, uh, we didn't want to dig all this out. It's another picture of the trail leading to the 
pedestrian dam. This dam is the dam that blocks up. Trail Creek is on your right, and the Cheney Run, it's, yeah, Trail Creek was on your left, excuse me, and the Cheney Run is on your right, and this prevents the water from discharging straight out to Trail Creek and forces it in through the wetland treatment facility. Uh, this is some of the understory wetland plants that were planted. Um, I'm not sure. I think it was told this is called sedge grass. Is that correct, Ted? Yeah, it's it's a type of, of sedge. Yeah. There you go. So there, that's one of the plants. And then this is uh, called water iris, a uh, wetland plant called water iris that was planted. This particular, one of the things that Ted designed, and it's a classic idea, is not only did he design this big area where we're going to be getting most of our treatment, I'll show you in a minute, he also designed these little micro pools and then some natural trails, just wooded trail that goes around those. And the design, the concept of those is to have these little micro pools where tadpoles and frogs can live and grow to help keep uh, the insects down. So, and then this is a picture of the bigger uh, wetland area where we're getting the treatment. And then the next, I'll show you a video of the water going over the rocks. The video was actually taken last year. Uh, it's grown up a lot more since then. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah it looks that. different today, yeah. for sure. Yep. Yeah, a lot of that the debris you see on the rocker. This was this was very soon after it was constructed. Yes, it was. So yeah, it's we were, we were looks... trying to wait. We were trying to wait for a good storm event, but it's been so dry. And then uh, we did have a lot of rain more recently. We should have went out there and, and, and got a better picture of it then. Um, so now let's talk about some of the pollution prevention. Uh, this site will capture or has captured. They're doing a great job. Uh, we monitor it once a week. It's been capturing 37.5 million gallons of stormwater annually. It's reduced sediment by 28,000 pounds a year and nutrient loading by 207 pounds a year. And uh, this is an old slide. We actually restored about seven acres of wetlands. Um, so that was the end of that. I just, uh, thank you, Ted. I wanna also, let me go back here for a second. Uh, this area back in here at this site would never have been built without a donation from uh, GAF they're an industry that was located right out to the west of the site. Uh, they owned a large part of this property. So did the city of Michigan City. They made a huge donation to the uh, sanitary district and they allowed us to construct uh, this facility. In fact, most of this area that you see right here in this wetland picture, uh, this was all property mostly owned by GAF. So I wanna hats off to them. And then uh, this is one of the things that uh, two years ago, uh, the partner, Partners for Pollution Prevention, uh, their, their theme was partnerships, and I just can't get past this. It is the key to sustainability and pollution prevention, and I want, I'm not going to go through all these. I just put some lists here of the, the many, many partners that we've partnered with here at the Sanitary District, uh, IDNR for one, DN, uh, IDEM. Uh, you've got B3 on here, GAF, the Great Lakes Alliance, Delta Institute, Fish and Wildlife, uh, Purdue is on this slide, uh, Sustain Our Great Lakes Program, the Great Lakes Commission, Trail Creek Watershed Group, and many other local partners. So we've had so many partners, and I just, I just really can't get past that. It's, it's really exciting. And then I need to put my plug in. As long as you're going to let me keep presenting, I'm going to keep putting a plug in for Partners for Clean Air. We're cleaning the air, clearing the air together. Um, this is actually from a 2019 slide. Yes, I need to update that. Uh, we have one new member, a gold, gold and silver level member, that's Praxair. And we have uh, Railcat, uh, Partners for Clean Air day, day at Railcat Stadium in Gary. We're actually having two games this year. Uh, please come out. Uh, we can get you tickets for the game. Uh, we give away bicycles every inning for kids. And then we're also going to give away an electric uh powered uh, lawn care equipment for this year to help with air pollution. So those are our, our two events, uh, our big event this year. Our, our annual luncheon, awards luncheon is usually handled, held at the end of April or early May. Uh, that was virtual. We're also hoping that we can go back to on-site next year. So please log on to the IDEM website, search for Partners for Clean Air and join the Northwest Indiana Partners for Clean Air. It's a great organization. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm done with my presentation. And I'll put this picture of, of um, Washington Park up here. 
And if there's any questions, I guess maybe we have some questions in the in the uh, in the chat. Should I try to go through and answer some of those, maybe? Huh? This is a question for Angela. Uh, oh yes, I forgot to say this. I can't believe our laboratory will also be receiving the IWEA Laboratory Excellence Award. Uh, they were nominated and voted the best laboratory in the state of Indiana by the Water Environment Association. Um, I had a note to say that and I went too fast. So congratulations, ladies, on that. And then uh, they will be receiving that award at the IWEA conference, which is in August, the end of August. I want to say the 25th through the 27th at, um, in Fort Wayne this year. Hope you can attend. Uh, great work on receiving the certification. Uh, Gene Fix is our win. Uh, do you know the decision behind using CNG instead of fully electric vehicles or trucks or whatnot? Um, basically, uh, the types of vehicles uh, that we use, uh, there were no electric vehicles really for sewer cleaning machines and garbage trucks at those times. And um, as far as the uh, pickup trucks and other that we use the electric vehicles at the time we started using CNG were not really that far advanced. It is something that we are looking at, uh, but please try to remember that the compressed natural gas really is the very, very low emitting pollution. Uh, and you know, when you have an electric vehicle, uh, you're still generating electricity from the power plant. And that's all we do is use some electricity to uh, run our compressors for that. But, it is something that we are looking at. We do have four electric vehicles uh, that we use to do all of our sampling and through around the plant. Uh, so we are fans of electric. And we also sponsored electric charging station for Michigan City. Uh, it's down at Millennium Park and you can charge your vehicle there if you'd like to. Um, uh, Ted asked if we capture our CNG on site. We do not capture it our digesters yet. Uh, it is something to look at, but in order to get the compressed natural gas clean enough to go into one of those vehicles, you have to get it pretty clean. You have to get out, you have to clean out what are called your siloxanes. And in order to clean out your siloxanes, you're looking at about a $900,000 to a million dollars to do that. If, and it's, there's really no, an economy of scale. If you're a bigger facility, you're probably looking at about one point million, one point million dollar facility. If you're a smaller facility like us, you're probably looking at $900,000 facility just to clean the siloxane. So it's a little bit, uh, cost uh, disadvantage there. What we are looking at right now, we're using all of our, our natural gas in the winter time, especially to heat our digesters. We do have a little bit of excess in the summer. What we are looking at is using that gas to run a generator to produce electricity to further uh, reduce our electrical usage. Um, did you quantify the sludge reduction across the digesters prior to the sludge press? Um, the sludge press uh, basically reduces our sludge from about four to five percent solids, uh, or ninety-five percent water, down to eighty percent water. So our solids are about uh, four uh, to maybe six percent entering the sludge press, and when it comes out of the sludge press, right around twenty percent solids. Uh, again, Jennifer made the note for those of you that are interested in CEUs. We'll be sending out an email for the form. Uh, for you to attend the meeting. I think we're going to try to put that link up here near the end. Uh, out of curiosity, how long is the trail? I don't know, Ted. Do you know how long that trail is at, at, the, at the Cheney Run? Um, yeah, it's about 2,000 feet, I think. And, and when we get the trail on the Carwick side, it will connect to all the other trails in Michigan City, which eventually will connect, which do connect to what's called our Singing Sands Trail, which takes you along Lake Michigan and then connects into the Calumet, Calumet Trail, which takes you all the way into Chicago. So uh, we're hoping that the Cheney Run Wetland Facility and the Carwick uh, Park can be one of the um, stops along the way. So it looks like those are all the questions in the chat room. Um, Try to do the best we could with this presentation. Uh, there's so much information that we could provide. Maybe we talk a little fast, but went a little quick. And uh, but I really appreciate everybody uh, participating, and I appreciated uh, the presentation from IUPUI and Angel's presentation and Ben's presentation. And I'd just like to 
uh, mentioned again, Partners for Pollution Prevention, a great organization, Partners for Clean Air, a great organization. Please take the time to reach out to those organizations and thank them and, and, and join those organizations if you're not already members. Did you want to have any uh, closing remarks uh, from you, Ben, or Jennifer? Well, Michael, I, I actually uh, got my microphone and video on. Uh, really, presentation, what can you say? I told you, I, I said to begin with, it was going to be an outstanding presentation of everything that you're able to accomplish. And, uh, you know, for one town the size of, of Michigan City, it seems like you accomplished more than towns three times your size are able to, to accomplish in a period of time. So I, I really, uh, you know, I, I thank you very much for, for hosting this meeting and really, really don't have anything else to say. I, I, Let me just say, I appreciate phenomenal. your compliment very much. And it would never be done without the leadership uh, uh, of our mayors and without the leadership of our, of our sanitary district board and without all the staff and the teamwork that goes along with that here at the sanitary district. Uh, we, we are very uh, blessed to have the staff that we have, a board that's supportive, that wants to see these changes. And, and as you said, it is a beautiful community. It has a lot going for it. And, uh, but thank you for the compliments, but it's certainly not uh, done without the teamwork of everyone and the leadership involved. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Ben. No, very, you're very welcome. No, and I understand and, and completely, I totally agree. Uh, if there isn't any other questions, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. Andy. Do you mind if I say something just in case people don't see it in the chat? Um, I just got a uh, notice from IDEM's uh, rules group, and there have been substantial changes to the rulemaking timeline and what's going to be adopted and effective and heard at the ERB meetings. Um, so I guess it's, you know, just uh, the universe saving you guys looking at all those detailed slides I couldn't show that all have to be changed now anyway. <laughs> so um, uh, I just wanted to share that. I thought it was oddly coincidental. And then um, in case you don't see my comment, Michael, I thought, the funding matrix and resourcefulness, and then the number of projects completed of diverse nature in such a short time frames is just absolutely impressive. It's you guys are doing a fantastic job. Thank you very much for the compliment. Like I said, it's a it's leadership and teamwork. So that's a, what gets the goals accomplished. Well. I think we're pretty much through with our with the meeting then. I appreciate everybody's attendance. I appreciate all uh, the uh, presentations. And Michael, I'll be talking to you in the future. I mean, I look forward to seeing you in September in person or maybe before that, if I can make it up there. Well, you're welcome anytime. And we look forward to seeing you too in September. And, and thank you again for allowing uh, Michigan City to host this. And um, we'd be glad to host again in the future if you would ever need us to. Okay? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And everybody online, uh, you guys have a great day and have a wonderful holiday weekend. Yeah, I'd like to thank everyone that participated too. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you, Michael. You're very welcome.